Good afternoon, um, and welcome to the May 18, 2021 Planning Commission work session. And we begin uh, by asking if there are any changes to the uh, agenda for this afternoon. Okay, we can go on to review the day's agenda. We do have a four o'clock case today. Um, so I believe Mr. Allen would give us a review of that. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission, Mr. Gullies. We do have one case at 4 p.m. It is case 21 PS0208 in the Clover Hill Magisterial District. We have Deer Hill Place LLC requesting planning commission approval for a schematic plan to reduce a buffer from 100 feet to 50 feet along a rear property line. This case is known as Deer Hill Scale Yard Schematic. We have received an email from the applicant um, consenting to the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, do commissioners have any questions for Mr. Allen at this time? No, okay. Um, Mr. Donahoe, will you go over our six o'clock agenda cases? Absolutely. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the commission, uh, Director Gillies, I'm Steve Donahoe with the Planning Department. You have 11 cases uh, this evening, two on deferral. Uh, four on consent and five for discussion. The first case is 20 is, is 20 SN 0516. It's in the Dale Magisterial District. It's the Chesterfield County Board of Supervisors requesting a conditional use to permit a private school and conditional use plan development to permit exceptions to ordinance requirements and development standards on 34.61 acres known as 6511 Belmont Road. Staff recommends approval and this has been placed in your consent agenda for this evening. Next case is 20 SN 0567 in the Clover Hill Magisterial District, Lake Adventures LLC. It requests, it requests amendment of zoning approval, case 16 SN 0704, relative to cash proffers, master plan, utilities, transportation improvements, density, uses, building heights, and phasing, plus a conditional use to permit the sale of alcoholic beverages to on -site and for on-site consumption for up to 500 feet of certain schools. The property is located in a regional business C4 district on 104.58 acres located on the northeast and northwest quadrants of Genito Road and Genito Place at Route 288. Just a note for the commission, the commission received an addendum this afternoon which clarifies a rear yard setback in track B for, for townhouses. Staff recommends approval and this case has been put on your discussion agenda th this evening. Next case is 21 SN 0527 in the Dale Magisterial District. Kenneth Lanky, Linda Hythos, and Simon Green request rezoning from Light Industrial I-1 and Agricultural A to Light Industrial I-1 on 21.43 acres with conditional use plan development to permit a contractor's office, shop, and storage yard on 13.4 acres. The applicant also seeks an exception to section 18 dash six zero of the utility ordinance for connection to public wastewater system. Staff recommends approval, and this has been placed in your discussion agenda this evening. Next case is 21 SN 0546 in the Midlothian Magisterial District. Westchester Towns Development Company, LLC, requests amendment of, of zoning approval, case 06 SN 0191, to permit a residential townhouse development in a general industrial I-2 district. The property is located on 13 and a half acres within the Westchester Commons Center with frontage along Watkins Center Parkway. Staff recommends approval, and this case has been placed in your consent agenda. Next is 21 SN 0575 in the Dale Magisterial District. McShay Communities request rezoning from Agricultural A to Residential R-12 on 11.2 acres located in the southeast corner of the intersection of Salem Church Road and Kingsland Road. The district commissioner is recommending a 60-day deferral to the planning commission's regularly scheduled July 20th, 2021 meeting. Next case, 21 SN 0589 in the Bermuda Magisterial District, Cassie Pomignano requests rezoning from residential R7 to corporate office 02 on, on 0.52 of an acre, property known as 58 or excuse me, 3815 Hundred Road. 
Staff recommends approval. In this case, it's been placed in your consent agenda. Next case is 21 SN 0603. It's in the Midlothian Magisterial District. Sean Worley requests an amendment to zoning approval case 05 SN 0249 to modify development standards relative to a tree preservation strip and setback in a residential R15 district on a 0.68 acre property known as 3625 Stone Harbor Drive. Staff does recommend approval and this is placed on your discussion agenda for this evening. Case 21 SN 0607 in the Clover Hill Magisterial District, that's the Village of Faith Med Ministries, requests conditional use for a tattoo parlor in a community business C3 district on an, an acre and a half property known as 10902 Hall Street Road. Staff recommends approval, and this case has been placed in your discussion agenda. Next is case 21 SN 0619 in the Matoka Magisterial District, Clover Hill. Assembly of God requests conditional use to expand the existing private school and child care, uh, child daycare uses and allow a conditional use plan development to permit exceptions to development standards on a 12.96, on the entire 12.96 acre property. Uh, this property is zoned agricultural and it's known as 12310 Bailey Bridge Road. Staff recommends approval. In this case, it's been placed in your consent agenda. Next is case 20 SN 0608 in the Matoica Magisterial District. Oasis Park LLC requests rezoning from Agricultural A to Residential Townhouse RTH District with a conditional use to permit, to continue to permit an existing communications tower and a conditional use plan development uh, to permit exceptions to ordinance requirements and development standards. The property consists of 59.8 acres fronting on the east side of Fox Club Parkway on the north side of Cosby Road and the south side of Millwood Lane School Lane. The district commissioner is recommending a 60-day deferral to the Planning Commission's regularly scheduled uh, meeting on July 20th, 2021. And lastly, case 21 SN 0548 in the, in the Matoka Magisterial District manage this request rezoning from Agricultural A to Multifamily RMF District with conditional use plan development to permit exceptions to ordinance requirements and development standards. The, re the request consists of seven parcels totaling 48.8 acres and is located on the south e southeast quadrant of the intersection of Otterdale Road and Woolridge Road. Staff does recommend denial, and this case is placed on your discussion agenda. This concludes your agenda review for this evening's cases. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do you commissioners have any questions for Mr. Donahoe about these cases at this time? Okay, thank you, Mr. Donahoe. Yes. So we can move right into our items uh, for discussion, and we're going to begin with Mr. Cash uh, giving us an overview of the Lake Adventures um, amendment case. And this is case 20SN0567 in the Clover Hill District. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. Um, th this is a case um, that has been before the Commission um, in its history um, several times. Um, it has been amended over time um, as we truly try to uh, improve it over time um, to make sure that different aspects of public safety were addressed um, and the ability for this um, project to hopefully prosper. Um, again, this is located, as Steve just uh, the, described it, you're located really fronting Genito Road, uh, primarily. Genito Place will bisect the property. It's currently zoned C4. This is an original mixed-use facility, I mean, um, area. Um, located adjacent to 288, but also we have the sports, um, sports complex uh, across 288 from it. Um, we have other venues that we hope to see coming in this area. It is directly located across the street from Clover Hill High School. Um, surrounding properties, uh, a little bit of a mix. We've got some RMF and some light industrial that surrounds it. Um, what I was going to do this afternoon is really start giving you a background history of the case, touch a little bit on what's proposed, but we also will have the applicant here um, to give you a little bit more of a, an update about what's really proposed in this project. Um, I know Gib and, and Gloria, of course, are very I'm so, are, are really familiar um, with this case, as well as several members of staff here as we work through this um, originally. Um, so the master plan has not changed. Um, this was originally provided in the 2016 case. 
Um, so we're really talking about mixed use development. We're expecting commercial, industrial, recreational, and high density residential um, to be within this property. Um, it should be noted on the tracks, um, track C, which is the upper right hand one that's blue, purple, depending on your color on the screen. Um, that one has the option to be industrial or a townhouse, but before they start the initiation of development for track B, they need to really determine what track C is gonna be because um, they're really integrated into how they develop their common space and other types of items. So originally, the time, there's a lot of input from the community, um, surrounding community, um, a lot of work back and forth with the applicants and, and staff and this commission. Um, I think we had four deferrals that were um, consent with the applicant, two deferrals that were put in place by the, the commission without consent of the applicant. So this was a case that was well vetted and went through several um, different uh, connotations as, the, as it was developed. Um, so originally, the, the first um, development, being a mixed-use development, what was interesting about it is that we're, this is a venue that intended to have a water park with it. And when we talk about that, we're talking about a 13-acre recreational lake that would come with it. Um, there's some amenities we've listed on the screen there. Um, that show you that we're related to that, um, an amphitheater. So it was intended to really be a destination. In addition, in that first phase, we'd get additional initial 20,000 square feet of um, commercial that's separate from that. Um, there was intention for a large white water attraction. Um, uh, we'll talk about a, an additional proposed attraction or alternative to that, uh, attraction today. Um, the residential de density at the time was 790 units. Um, Limited to 390 of those would have been um, multifamily, and they would have been in that track day, which is the track closest um, up to Genito Road. Um, there are design standards that are within this ordinance that were really new. I mean, I'm sorry, within this case for residential development that was really new at the time. We call for a three-tier system of, of architectural evaluation. Um, so it really is the promotion of high quality um, type of townhouse and multifamily development. That was really a key aspect for this as we recognize that we're gonna have a lot of um, residential coming here and, and you know, it takes a little bit of time for that res um, commercial and the water park and stuff to develop. Um, other elements that were really worked through in this case and, and shown in the original case was of course access. Um, we're talking about an area where we're talking about putting in a lot higher density um, when you really only had Genito Road at that location. So a lot of talk about the access road improvements. Phasing of residential improvements um, and units was really important. So it was based upon the water park construction and some commercial square footage. Um, and what I'll do is at the end of this, I'll quickly run through some of those, the phasing so you can see how it's balanced in the new case. Um, cash profits are $9,400 was in place for um, roads, but also for the, town, for the townhouses, but it could also be phased out over time, depending on how much commercial came into play. Environmental and health standards went into this recreational lake and this water facility. Um, at the time, that was a big concern for the commission um, board and the public. Um, our, with the applicant working with us, bringing in experts and our, health, our environmental um, engineering, utilities, and our health department really worked out good conditions to ensure public safety for those facilities. We also instilled noise limitations. Um, the board imposed specifically an operational days limitation as well for the, um, for the attraction um, to help mitigate the impact on the surrounding neighborhoods. In particular, we actually name in the case individual neighborhoods um, for Brandon Mill where we set a, a certain decibel level. Um, we'll move into the 18 case. Really, that case really relied a little bit more focused on what the lake was doing or how it could be managed. Um, it addressed source of water for the recreational lake. It actually permitted um, some public water to be used um, from the water system with utilities approval. Prohibited discharge of the recreational waters into our public wastewater system, but did allow for, and a lot of discussion went into that of how to treat those waters so it could go into the system. Um, we also reduced the buffer planning for townhouse development along Genito Place. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but really is the idea to promote more of an urban design along Genito Place. So you're talking about a mixed use, very active center, um, appropriate um, streetscaping um, for that townhouse development was approved. 
and alternative treatment along Genitor Road for tracks D and E, and adjustment to the planning standards along Route 288. So what are we talking about in this new case? Um, we're actually talking, uh, first off, a change potentially for the, the water park attraction, the main water feature, and that would be an alternative uh, attraction being a surf pool. Um, I'm sure the applicant will go into it more, but it's at a, proffered at a minimum of one acre in size, um, which is pretty large, um, they, they anticipate bigger. Um, there is an increase in overall residential density. So we're talking about an additional 400 units, went from 790 to 1190. Um, you know, that was a concern when I really first got into this case, how are we balancing that? What is the, what's the gain um, for that? Or how is this residential um, development being offset? Um, so 500, what they propose is really 1190, you're talking about 830 of those max could be multifamily. But where we're talking about this multifamily going is primarily inside of the mixed use track. Um, so you're really talking, focusing in the commercial area. Um, track A, which is the original multifamily, is actually reduced in the number of units. So really the focus is now shift for the heavy multifamily to be within the areas where probably more appropriate and what our comprehensive plan really looks for is mixed use areas. They'll also be located inside of mixed use buildings with a minimum of 20,000 um, square feet of commercial within that building, limited to 300 per building. Um, they also provided, proffered a, a maximum of 5% of the bedrooms could be, I mean, I'm sorry, the units could be three bedrooms or more. But I think what is really a good point for this one, which is unique and special, really unique for Chesterfield, um, but in their, in their provisions, it also says 95% of the parking from the mixed use building has to be located in structured parking. That right there is actually a, is, is a good investment that, that is, really helps to offset the impact of the multifamily. You're talking about the real estate value, taxation value of that, but also what that shows um, for other investors or people to come locate within that community um, that a lot of the parking is taken care of. Um, we've also included provisions in the case about how that's located to make sure it still um, looks good, it's located behind the buildings or it has the good, um, it is comparable to the buildings that are there. Um, I would also say that also provides potential more space for more commercial development to come along, which is something we'd really hope and would encourage would occur with this case. Um, next is um, a change to the townhouse development. They've actually called for a reduction, a request a reduction from 10% down to 7% for the common area within those developments. Um, staff is generally supportive of that for this case because we have a 13, acre recreational lake that's generally walkable. There are sidewalks and other connections to that community. Um, so uh, we think that the amenities um, of the surrounding community help offset um, that reduction in common area. Um, they, do, they are still required to have a clubhouse. They've just um, asked to reduce the clubhouse um, slightly for that. Again, you're in a mixed use environment. We would anticipate those type of things to be supportable. Um, additionally, they've requested to utilize um, a 16 foot a wide townhouse model. Um, previously, I believe the case was at 19. Um, what's in, in addition to this, and, and you know, part of that is really you're, you have the ability to bring in a different um, number of price points within a community. So you have a variety of different sizes of townhouses. But I would say the applicant has offered something that really helps offset what we see as potential impact of that is for each 16 foot unit that's provided in a row, they have to provide a 24 foot unit which is actually large for a townhouse um, under, uh, under our base ordinance, but ones that, I mean, we see them frequently, but it is a little bit larger than the base ordinance would provide for. Um, and then a maximum of 20% of the units could be 16 feet. Um, alcoholic beverages for on-site consumption is being requested in this, and actually that's an encouragement of the staff to, to, to make sure they do this. Previous case did pro um, provide for a brewery on the site, um, but it did not address um, what the ordinance requires, which precludes on-site alcohol consumption for sale within 500 feet of a school. Of course, we have Clover Hill High School across the street, but the, it's mitigated by the, the mixed use, mix of uses that we have here and what we'd really anticipate a mixed use center to have, a variety of restaurants and the like. Um, 
the cash buffers are being deleted, and then we do have adjustment to residential phasing, um, which quickly I'll just go through to show you that, you know, we feel like the balance is still there. The original 16 case um, provided that after the completion of the lake and the water park and the 20,000 square feet, um, the developer could have up to 150 um, townhouse units. Um, currently, they're requesting to go up to 190. Now, again, the multifamily that came forward with the first case has been reduced by actually that amount um, for the Tract A. Um, now, before they can to get the next 150 units, there has to be a completion of 150,000 square feet of gross floor area of commercial space. So really, there has to be a, a large amount of commercial investment um, that's, that's put into play. There is formulas in the case that talk about a hotel has a certain number of account stores and a certain amount of square footage um, and the like that has previously been in the case. Um, so again, we don't ex this case isn't designed and, and staff was careful and the applicant workforce originally and continue to do so that we're balancing the commercial and other types of investment in the project before the multifamily really gets to take off, especially the, the more um, traditional single family type of style of a townhouse. Um, I guess so we'll, we'll talk about quickly about the multifamily originally in 2016, Tract A, um, which basically they could come in for that once they've committed and commenced um, the water park features, which the things I showed you on the screen was the amphitheater, 20,000 square foot of commercial, um, the ski, the, the, the whatever, the share lift uh, that goes with the recreational lake. The recreational lake itself has to be constructed. Uh, I mean, committed and commenced before they can get the first tract A um, apartments. It was 390, now it's down to 290. Um, now for the multifamily inside of the mixed use buildings. Now, as I said before, these have to be in these mixed use buildings with probatic commercial and structured parking. They do um, have to at least brought the um, lake up to the stage where it's been constructed and it's received its approval from, from DCR. Um, and that's spelled out in the, in the case as well. So at that point, they can start their multifamily and mixed use building construction. So again, um, you know, we, we're a staff, I will say staff originally for this case back in 2016 was not supportive of the original case. This case has evolved over time. Our perceptions of mixed use development has also evolved over time. Um, so, you know, with what they've requested in this, um, a, amendment um, to the previous case. You know, staff is, um, wants to support this. We feel like, uh, like I said, the improvements that are provided really offset the impact. Um, the cash profit reduction, we're still getting the road, road improvements that um, were originally supposed to come with the case. Um, we have good phasing in place to make sure that there's still the protection there that residential development impact is offset by the commercial that comes forward. So um, any questions for me before I turn it over? Um, Commissioner Sloan. Thank you, Commissioner Fry. Uh, Ray, thanks. Thank you for the update. Um, I, I'll be real upfront with you. I mean, I think we've, you know, this has been around a while, and we, we've gone through lots. I, I actually really think the actions that the applicant um, has taken this last go around. I, I actually think we have a better case than what we previously approved. Um, I really do. My, my question really is this. Um, because I'm, I'm sure the you know the applicant's ready to turn this turn this project into a reality. Do we foresee um, at this point in the game? Um, and I apologize for using the word game, but uh, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Do, do we foresee any other issues? Um, and again, I I I know <laughs> these. Well, I mean, later Director Gillies is going to bring up some stuff with Jeff Davis and with these massive projects. There's some things that we just don't know until we get in and we start using them and things like that. But are there any things that are on the radar that we think are out there that could hold us up or hold this project up um, from a legislative standpoint or a commission standpoint or some sort of a zoning issue that um, is still out there unresolved? Um, yeah, I guess to off the top of my head, I, I just really, from a, from a zoning standpoint, we've addressed the case as best as we can for that. I would say the challenges of development at this point for uh, any builder, any developer, 
is going to be pretty large with the with the ability of shortage of materials, manpower, and all these other type things. No, no, I'm talking about from. I mean, from do we a, think with with from, the with the approval of this zoning case, with this mm -hmm. this zoning case, we'll be in a where everything's over on the site plan side and working through the approval of all of that to where it, it kind of, you know, it's heading towards the light, so to speak. Um, I, I will say so. I think we, you know, it's like in 2018, we worked through some issues that we saw were, were perhaps um, were roadblocks to the apartment development for track A. Um, mm -hmm. we've, we've, we learned that as we went through 2018, tweaked that a little bit. I think we've addressed it better now in this case as well to let it move forward. Um, I think the first phase of site plan, I believe, has been a, approved for this, which is the water park construction area. So that can be going and be moving any time. Um, you know, I think when you think about the mixed use project, I do. It's going to depend. You know, we're at, we're dependent upon another agency approval for that lake approval. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's something that's well outside of our control. So, um, you know, I would see that something as could be a potential. You know, snag is something we can't really help through our um, through our processes, but we do think that that's a good balance. So that way, we make sure the lake is there, viable, and and moving forward before we start having other investment come in. Great, thank you. Do any other commissioners have any questions for um, Mr. Cash? Okay. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. That was a great I'll overview. I'll be back tonight. <laughs> yes, uh, Mr. Wilson, did you have a few points you wanted to add? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Jack Wilson, I represent the applicant and represented the applicant back in those days. Just reliving that was a little you know, <laughs> uh, cause for concern, but we do think this is a, a, a vast improvement over the case that we had before. Um, to answer specifically Mr. Sloan's question, we do have the phase one site plan has been approved. That's the main lake, the amphitheater, all of those elements that were in that phase one. Uh, while the zoning case required that that phase one have 20,000 square feet of commercial. The actual site plan has two buildings with 43,000 combined. So we're ahead of even what the zoning case requires. But we think this is an improvement over the existing case from a number of standpoints. One, uh, we have maintained the same balance between the residential development and the commercial development, which is something that staff, Ms. Fry, Mr. Winslow, and the board were concerned that we maintained. And the way we sort of accomplish that with these mixed use buildings is they are required to bring the commercial with them because that's on the first floor and it's a minimum of 20,000 square feet of that commercial. So you don't get any of that upper, upper level residential without that main floor being viable. And then you combine the structured parking component with it. We think that just adds to the ability to bring higher density commercial development to the site because of the county's ordinance, you know, shared parking, et cetera. So um, we are still maintaining all the same road improvements that were agreed to uh, in the original case. And in fact, in the new case, um, those road improvements will likely be accelerated than they would have been under the old case because under the old case, they were triggered by trip counts which was primarily going to be driven by the commercial development and overall development. Here, in order to get the credit for the road cash proffer, we're probably going to have to put some of those roads in earlier than they would otherwise be warranted in order to get the credit towards the cash proffer. So again, that's an improvement over the existing case. Um, but I think, in, and we've got the high quality uh, residential that um, um, Ray showed, and I think, and Brett, the, the developer applicant is going to do a quick presentation to sort of give you the, really what the vision is. I mean, obviously, we've gone through the details of the case and what's involved, but, you know, maybe a two or three minute, just see what the picture looks like, see all the new commissioners can see what this is going to look like um, from a visual standpoint as opposed to just the language. Um, Madam, I think we may run out of time right now. Yeah, we've I got a four o'clock case. If we could, why don't we just kind of put his presentation on hold. We'll do the four o'clock session and then come, come back, back and finish it up. We've got probably 45 minutes. See, I was, I was rushing so I can talk for another 10 or 15 minutes then when I come back <laughs> up, right? <Yeah>. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna get ready for the four o'clock um, case. Um, Call to order the four o'clock public hearing. Uh, are there any changes to the four o'clock agenda that commissioners have? No. 
Uh, hearing none, Director Gillies, would you please review the meeting procedures? Yes, ma'am. Um, the Planning Commission makes the final decision on approvals for certain site plans, schematic plans, tentative subdivision plans, development standard modifications, and appeals of the director's decision. If the commission approves or denies the request, there is no further public hearing. The following afternoon's meeting, uh, you'll be able to obtain information on uh, this case. Uh, if it were deferred um, by calling 751-4610 and entering the last three digits of the case number. Uh, you may obtain information on any of the cases uh, for which there was a final action by calling the planning department number, main number, which is 748-1050. Okay, thank you, Director Gillies. Uh, we just have the one case, and it is case 21PS0208 in the Clover Hill District, Deer Hill Place, LLC presented by Mr. Allen. Can I? Okay, thank you. Good afternoon again. Good afternoon. Glad to present this to faces that I can see fully and friendly. It's just nice to be back here before you. This case this afternoon is a schematic approval for a buffer reduction regarding a storage yard in the Clover Hill Industrial Park. This industrial park is a valuable component of Chesterfield County, there are actually not that many places where contractors can feel comfortable locating and finding a place for open storage within a relatively private setting. It isn't, um, it doesn't bother other folks. So this is basically a, an open storage yard, um, but it has to be going through a process of site plan approval for, um, for its implementation. And we ran into this issue of one buffer that needed to be reduced from 100 feet to 50 feet, um, similar to other buffers within this Clover Hill Industrial Park. The site, as you can see it located here in, in the red area, is just off of Genito Road, which is to the north of it. It backs up to a remaining piece of agricultural property with some residences on it. That buffer we're talking about is basically that shared property line between the agricultural property and the use on this site. Currently, the zoning case requires 100 feet and they're requesting to get on to 50 feet. This just shows an aerial view. You can kind of see that the site currently is heavily treed as well as to the east, but to the, to the north where those houses are, those are kind of open fields with houses and then you have Genito Road. You might notice in that um, top right-hand corner of the site, it gets closest to Genito Road and that involves one of the two conditions where we realize that some view of that outside storage area might be, might be visible from the east and the, the condition speaks to um, extending a part of the screening fence on that side. Just going back to the legal procedures for this case, this is the zoning condition. I kind of underlined the part that is important to you, which is this buffer, however, may be modified by the Planning Commission at the time of schematic plan review if the adjacent property has been zoned and or developed for commercial or industrial uses, or if a plan has been submitted which accomplishes sufficient buffering and lesser width. And that's the process we're in today. Um, this is the site plan. I know it's, it's in black and white, so it's kind of hard to see everything that's happening, but the gray area is the storage area. The hatched gray area at, at the top with the black line at the top is the um, is the part where the buffer is being reduced from 100 feet down to 50. So that's 50 foot wide width. And then the white area above that dark gray line, uh, dark black line, is the remaining forested 50 foot buffer before you get to the agricultural property. You will notice that in this image, there's a part of that forested area which bulges into the buffer um, adjacent to the agricultural property. The second condition speaks to where staff will be um, verifying that the density of this buffer is sufficiently um, meeting a certain density and that we will be inspecting that throughout the process in the time of CO. So the two conditions that I spoke to, the first one was about extending an eight foot screening fence, which could either be vinyl or composite wood fence, eight feet tall, to extend it not just along the shared um, buffer line, but also along the east line for about 80 feet to, to prevent um, view of the, of the outside storage. And then the, that will follow through with landscape plans and inspections um, 
to make sure that everything is installed according to plan. Those are the two conditions. The applicant has emailed us saying that he um, consents to these conditions, and that's where we are today. Okay, do uh, commissioners have any questions for Mr. Allen about this proposal? Um, would the applicant like to speak or they're not present? The applicant let us know that he would not be here, but that okay. he consented. Okay, thank you. I will open the public hearing, um, and I would ask Mr. Allen, did the staff receive any citizen comments about this? A good question, but request? no, we did not. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, this case is in Clover Hill. Uh, likewise, I did not receive any citizen comments about this um, schematic plan either. But this is a public hearing. Is there anyone present who would like to speak to this case? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, th as I said, this is in the Clover Hill District, and having received no opposition uh, and with the applicant's acceptance of the conditions, I move that we follow the staff's recommendation and approve case 21 PS0208 subject to the conditions. Second. And there's a second. Any discussion? No discussion. Hearing none, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we can go back to um, the discussions we were having about Lake Adventure. And um, Mr. Wilson, were you finishing up or did you? Have a few more comments. Okay. <laughs> we appreciate that. Sorry for the interruptions, but well, thank not a problem. You for no, um, I was trying to rush the last time. But the one other point resume. I did want to make, and and, uh, and uh, Ray mentioned, one of the things we also are doing in this case is adding the flexibility to put the surf pool in as opposed to the white water. Um, it's it's probably greater capital cost to put the surf pool in than the original white water. But that's one of the other changes we're putting in the case. So I think it'd be helpful for Brett to give an overview of the vision. And Ray, you've got his. Hello, good afternoon. Nice good afternoon, to see Mr. Everybody Burkhart. Again. Uh, I guess we'll go through a little presentation I put together just with some images. Uh, even listening to staff talk about this case, I get a little bit lost in the numbers and all the text, and I'm far from an attorney, and that's definitely not what I do. I'm more of a the visual guy. I like to see pictures and things I can touch. So I thought I would just kind of walk you through some of these uh, these images. Uh, here's the overview of the uh, development. This is kind of how we have it planned and uh, it's described in the current case. So you can see the big lake is at the bottom, the 13-acre lake. That's along 288. Uh, we have the surf pool, which is the other big body of water. They're actually separate. And then the amphitheater in the middle, surrounded by all the commercial and mixed-use developments um, around it. So a lot of times we get the question, is this a, uh, a water park? It was kind of branded early on in this project that it was a water park with slides and lazy rivers. It's really not, I gotta tell everyone many times that it, what it is not is not a water park. We do have water features, which are uh, activities inside the lake and the surf pool, but they're, uh, they're not traditional in, uh, in any sense. And so some of the things we have is like cable skiing. Uh, we'll have an aqua course in the, in the uh, big lake. These are really popular, kind of like a floating trampoline course. And, uh, and then of course the surf pool, which is our our bigger, more kind of uh, notable attraction that um, when we came 
uh, when we announced it last year and made worldwide news. So it's uh, kind of an exciting new industry that's that's popping up. But more importantly, outside of the water, what we really are is we're a place for people to gather, to bring their friends and families and kids. Um, the One of the original ideas for this park was the U.S. National Whitewater Center of Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, here you can kind of see a picture of it. They got the water on the left-hand side. But for every one person that comes and gets wet, there's another nine people that come in shorts and shoes and sandals. And they come just to hang out and be part of this cool environment. So the park was really designed to be uh, more of a dry experience than a wet experience. The wet experience, the surf and the lake are just kind of the attractions that make it unique and something special to uh, not just Chesterfield, but to the region. And then at the center of our park, we have a, uh, an amphitheater. This isn't, a, uh, this isn't like a ticketed national touring event. This is more free concerts, Thursday, Friday, Saturday concerts, open to the public uh, for a free admission. And this is something we're just kind of giving back to, again, uh, create that energy in the center of this park. Uh, here's kind of a site plan that shows an aerial view of the, uh, the different components and how they fit around the lake and the amphitheater and the surf pool. And then I'll show you kind of where this has been done in other areas, the mixed use with the entertainment. And Avalon, which is in Alpharetta, Georgia, this is about a 100 acre mixed use development um, with a lot of residential and also commercial. Its main attraction is anchored by a, a, a movie theater. And, uh, and then what they did is this big green space that you can see in the middle. They programmed that with about 200 different events for, throughout the year. And these are events like a dog show at lunch, yoga in the morning, and maybe a beer or wine festival in the evenings on the, uh, in the afternoon. So again, not huge, massive events, just more of a way for people to kind of gather into a central place. And then as a result, it activates the space in this mixed-use development. It makes it become a very lively place to be. That's why people want to live there. That's why businesses want to have offices there. And that's why restaurants want to be there, because it's all this foot tra traffic you end up generating. Another one is uh, North Hills in Raleigh, North Carolina. This actually started as a failed mall that they uh, kind of redeveloped started opening the parking lots up to a uh, concert series on Thursdays. It became so popular, they, on their second phase, they ended up putting in a permanent amphitheater with green space, and um, it becomes a very popular place on Thursday nights uh, still to go. And now here, finally, are some uh, renderings of our development and what we're kind of working on, starting with the townhomes, which is in a separate section across Genito Place from our commercial development. We're going for kind of a higher end mix of uh, townhome products. So here you can see a 16 foot product anchored to a 24 foot product. And then throughout the townhome development, we're gonna have, try and have a variety of different product types just to make it a more of a dynamic uh, a resident mix in there. Uh, along the lake, we'll have kind of a, a boardwalk along the lake with some restaurants and uh, some offices. And then you can see it kind of goes uphill to the mixed use development in the back. Uh, we have a streetscape, uh, just like a traditional mixed-use development, trying to get cars in there, interacting with the uh, people, and again, some of the offices and restaurants that need kind of that car, trans uh, car traffic to uh, support their business. And then th th what I'm most proud about, this is actually in our phase one. This is our entertainment zone. So this is a commercial corridor. Uh, these are actual renderings of what we have permitted and getting ready to start construction on. This is pedestrian-only corridor. And these are restaurants, breweries, wineries that are going in here. Um, not national chains, a lot of local stuff, some stuff out of DC, just unique opportunities. And what I think is so cool about this is there's no cars, so it's, it's pedestrian only. And when I started this project, everyone in the industry looked at me and they were like, you're crazy because you got to have so many parking spots in front of the restaurant, otherwise no restaurant tour is going to want to going to want to be here because they can't make money. And this is actually the most demanded spot in our entire development. So where we're getting the unique, funky restaurants and breweries, they want to be back here where all the entertainment is, and they don't care about cars. So I think that's a big shift you're seeing in real estate in general. And then it's only been magnified this past year with pandemic has kind of like put everyone five years in the future where they're like, we got to be next to foot traffic, people, outdoor entertainment, and big open spaces. So this is something that I'm kind of most proud about. This is the reverse side of that. It, these are the buildings, again, that are permitted. We have kind of a mezzanine overlook in the amphitheater, and uh, it's just going to be a really cool spot. And then finally, I'll end. This is just the, uh, the main area of entertainment. This is the hub. 
this is our anchor for the whole mixed use development. So it's big green space that can be multi-programmed throughout the year. And then the, in the peripheral, you have the surf, you have the lake, you have the amphitheater. You just have all these different opportunities to activate the space with just any kind of unique event you can come up with. And eventually that's what is gonna drive people to the development from a commercial standpoint, residential standpoint, and otherwise. So thank you for your time. And uh, I appreciate all the help throughout the years. Do um, commissioners have any questions for Mr. Burkhart or Mr. Wilson? Or for Mr. Cash, even? Uh, Commissioner Sloan. Brad, all I, all I want to say is if, if your drive to make this thing as successful as it can be, once, once you can actually get going with it, as you've had through this process, we're going to have something really fantastic there. I would like to express my appreciation to Mr. Burkhart, Mr. Wilson, and to Mr. Cash for working through all the details. Uh, it's a pretty complex case and a lot of different pieces to the puzzle and making them all fit. Um, it, it's taken some time and some effort, but I do think it's a very good result, a, a good end result. We've accomplished the goals and objectives. and. I'm excited to see the vision and actually to hear that site plans are being approved and you're moving forward. It's really, really exciting. I appreciate that, Gib. Uh, you and Gloria, you were here originally and I had no idea what I was doing when I first came into this and I've fumbled my way through it over the past few years with the help of a lot of uh, really good consultants and, and really good input from people like you. So I appreciate your help and continue to listen to me and work with me to make this thing better. And uh, yeah, it was, it was hard. Three years of permitting just on the lake alone, we had to write our own rule book that's now being used worldwide for these large water attractions. So that's really cool too. And uh, on Thursday, we have our final site meeting to get the uh, final sign off with EE so we can actually start construction. So hopefully we'll actually see some trees coming down very soon. So thank you guys for your help. Very exciting, thank you. So the next item uh, on our discussion portion of the agenda is um, the update of the Midlothian Design Standards, and that's going to be presented by Ms. Wawarka. Good afternoon, members of the commission. Um, I think while we're waiting to get the work session PowerPoint up. Yep. I um, want to thank you for your time this afternoon. I uh, just have a brief presentation to go over some of the revisions um, that were included in the latest draft ordinance um, that was uh, provided to you all ahead of your public hearing this evening. Um, so as I mentioned last month, um, since February, staff, along with Commissioner Petrosky, um, have met with uh, several groups within the area, as well as individuals, um, to both present the draft ordinances, uh, review with groups and individuals, as well as receive feedback and, and comments on the draft. Um, and based on some of those comments that were received, we've prepared several revisions um, that we're going to kind of go over today. Um, so here's just a summary of the major revisions that were um, prepared based on the comments that we heard. Um, one of the really kind of major ones that was included was the parking setbacks along Midlothian Turnpike. We heard a lot from the business community um, as well as some of the shopping center owners um, within the area um, that the original draft uh, was maybe a little bit too restrictive um, for that and I'll go into more details on what we're recommending in the current draft in the coming slides. Um, we also added uh, topography as one of the considerations for screening of things like automobile oriented uses as well as parking. So knowing that um, within Midlothian and especially on Midlothian Turnpike, it's not just completely flat, that topography can provide screening for that in addition to the things like hedges, um, walls and fences that were originally included. Um, we also revised um, the percentage of masonry requirement, um, and particularly on the upper floors of buildings and building design, um, and addressed some alternative, alternative materials language um, to clarify that a little bit better. Um, we've also um, amended the size of individual uses 
Uh, we've increased the cap um, on the percentage of three bedroom plus multifamily units, um, as well as an amendment on the building height for mixed use and multifamily. So as I mentioned, the parking setbacks, particularly um, for Midlothian Turnpike, um, originally we had um, basically that no parking could be located between the building and the street. That is still true um, in the draft that we've written. Um, before we had that the parking had to be located no closer than the rear facade, so basically pushing all parking um, behind buildings, and if there wasn't a building on the lot, that it would have to be even further back. Um, knowing the constraints on some of the sites and the potential um, for people to want to see some parking from Midlothian Turnpike, uh, we have revised this to now be no closer than the front facade of the building. So you can see in the top, ex or in both of the examples here, where the parking is more in line with the building there. Um, and that it has to be set, if there is no building, set back at least 35 feet. That is the maximum um, setback for a building that we've included. So we're trying to align the parking with the building setbacks as well. Um, and then we have not touched the uh, parking setbacks for other roads, but I just want to provide that. So we're kind of mirroring a little bit um, what we had for the other roads within the area for Midlothian Turnpike. Um, and again, trying to uh, prevent parking from really becoming um, you know, the main thing you see from Midlothian Turnpike, but allowing for some flexibility in those options where it may need to be a little bit closer than how we originally drafted it. Um, as far as architectural treatment, we did allow for some additional flexibility when it came with to the percentage masonry requirements, and particularly on the upper floors, um, where we originally had a percentage required for um, brick, stone, masonry, and other materials, we've now um, added flexibility for that to include high quality materials on those upper facades. For the size of individual uses, um, we have increased the size of individual uses, the limit that we had um, from 10,000 10, up to 12,000. This is for non-residential uses, um, and this is still exclusive, exclusive of office and hotels. We did remove um, grocery stores from this. Originally, we had a cap of 50,000 square feet on grocery stores, um, and that is uh, something that we're kind of working out to make sure we get that language exactly right for you all as well. As far as the mixed use and multifamily development, uh, we added some clarifying language to the additional common area for buildings that exceed three stories. Um, it was brought to our attention that it wasn't initially clear um, that that additional common area was for the units on those upper floors. So we made sure that that was clear. Um, and for the limit of number of three bedroom plus units, we have increased it from 5% to 10% in the draft. And then lastly, um, as far as building heights go, uh, the draft ordinance still sets the maximum building height for office and commercial uses at three stories. Um, based on what we heard from the community as well as discussions with Commissioner Petrosky, um, we've recommended and included in the draft that the additional height could go from up to four to five stories. Um, for the mixed use or multifamily, and still with the additional considerations in place that were provided for in the previous draft. So this is that it would be located further um, than 100 feet from Midlothian Turnpike or single family development. They would have to provide that additional common area that I kind of hit on before, um, and that some of the parking would be provided through, a percentage of the parking would be provided through deck parking. Um, those are the major revisions that were presented in the draft uh, before you this evening. Um, and then we have a presentation this evening uh, prior to your public hearing that is scheduled. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have this afternoon. Do commissioners have any questions at this time? All right. Thank you. Right. Very Thank nice you. overview. Thank you. Okay, so we can move to um, our third third item on discussion, which is a progress report on the Enterprise Land Management System, and that'll be presented by Ms. Sundar. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Andy, and uh, every other staff. 
Uh, I'm happy, I'm very happy here to be presenting the update on ELM, which we implemented after so many years, actually a few years. So we went live to, uh, sorry, we <laughs> went live on uh, February 15th, and uh, I'm sorry, I just got blank. <laughs> uh, Steve, next slide. Yeah, we went live on February 15th, and uh, as you, as I, the same way, <sighs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, as my previous presentation to the commission, the main objective of this uh, application, can you go to the next one, please? Uh, the main objective of this application was to increase the online services and uh, show transparency and uh, have a shared view of all the projects between the other departments, everyone, and automate the processes so that we can reduce our time. So, to the next slide, please. We in the planning department, we have implemented almost 24 applications in this ELM system, of which 23 of them we have already got submitted through online, except our zoning opinion application, which is all back office. All the other applications have been submitted online. And uh, next one. So in the online, the main reason what we wanted to do is the applications, plans, and the pay fees online, and uh, also scheduling the inspections online. Through this, we have almost got like between January 15th and today, we got 315 applications we have been processing in this system, of which 177, next slide please, 177 of them are submitted online. And uh, 41 of them are in the back office, which is mostly zoning opinion applications that we enter it in the back office. And also, very happy to say, like, almost 50% of those online submitted applications, like 86 of them, they have paid the fees online through credit card or e-payment. So we are in a great transition. And almost all the applicants in this three months, I have drastically seen the reduction in their inquiry of how to do it, where can I find stuff. So it is reducing, coming, I'm not hearing it much, it has been slowly progressing. Even our staff have getting, got comfortable with the new system in this. I just heard from Steve today like, oh, this is so nice, I like it. So mm -hmm. people are getting so used and comfortable with this. So next one, please. And uh, the main thing, other important one that we all were aspiring was the transparency. So we wanted public to have access to what we are seeing what we are doing. So the case information and the documents that we are processing in our cases are live. It is whatever we update today in the back office, whatever comments we do in the back office, it's being updated immediately on, the on, uh, on our website, on the online portal, where the applicant or anyone can go and see. Actually, the world world can see it except for certain type of documents, which we have not released it to public, like the working documents. Until it is approved, we'll not have the staff report, or the plans will not be available to the public, but once the case is approved, those documents are available to the public. Uh, next one, please. So this is mainly for the applicant, the live status the applicants can see their status live, and the comments on their cases or on the reviews, they can see it on live. So if you see at the processing tab when they log in, or even some of the public, even they can see where that particular case is in. So it, it will give us the comments, the check mark means some of the department have commented, and. Uh, so that is an another one which uh, the applicants can see where they stand and if something, the due date is not showing and they haven't received, they can call us and say like, oh, what's happening? I'm not seeing. 
So that's the transparency that we were trying to accomplish with this application. Uh, next one, sir. And of course, the big one was the automation. So we have automated certain tasks both for back office and also for the applicant. For example, the fee, they get automatic invoice on the fee payment. They can submit it online. And uh, the review consolidation, when all the departments complete their review, they get a notification on an email and a report. And also when a case is the final status, the applicant gets the notification, automated emails. And in the back office, we have helped our staff. We have an automated fee calculation based on the data that is provided. And uh, we also have automated task activations and the due dates of when the task needs to be completed. And of course, some of the notices and the letters are all kind of, we don't have to manually write a notice. We gather the data and then we have created some good reports and uh, notices. So this automation have helped our staff in doing and focusing on the other stuff. Uh, next one, sir. And of course, this is what uh, we have done and we are all in the big process. So next one is decommission our legacy systems, PIMS and uh, CEDIS. And uh, we just had a meeting yesterday and uh, everything is going good as planned. That's the quick update. And sorry about the starting problem. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Do commissioners have any questions? Uh, Commissioner I, Owens. I have a question. Sure. At this point, has the public access to the all other systems besides ELM been shut off? No. Public does not have access to the legacy systems. Public has only access to L. Okay, that's yeah. what I was asking. Yeah. So we've cut the public completely off to the legacy. Okay. Uh, pu public have never had an access okay. to the legacy. All right, great. I yeah. just want to make sure of that. So that was the main focus on this one because public can see it upfront doing through this online portal. Great. Okay. Any other questions for um, for El? Thank you. I, the first two months of this, you know, was a real struggle for us to make sure uh, we got off on the right foot. But Corel has done a huge job of kind of keeping this moving forward and and keeping us all on task. And uh, it, it's been a, a really satisfying um, couple of months to see where we started in February 15th to where we are now. And I think everything is starting to move a lot smoother throughout the online system. And it's due in part a lot to uh, Corel's involvement with this, as well as Greg McIntyre and several other members of our staff that have spent a lot of time working on this. So it's been a big project. Good, thank you very much. Um, so the next item that we have to consider is approval of the uh, minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the April 20, 2021 minutes? Motion. Uh, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the vote? Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Thank you. Okay. Um, so we're going to go next to the um, Planning Commission work program update. And I think we were going to start with Mr. Hosh. I'm going to cover both sides today. And I guess I okay. can take this mask Okay, you got off. it. All right, I don't have a joke for you today, unfortunately. So. Steve, Steve over there doesn't like my joke, so he told me not to do one. Um, code amendments today. Uh, the zoning ordinance is, is the major, of course, project. Uh, you will have a big update, I would say, in June coming up, so stay tuned for that. That should be the presentation of our diagnostic report. Uh, we have just received that from the uh, consultants, the first draft of that, so we're taking a look at that right now. So uh, we are looking forward to having that presented to you all in June. Uh, so that, that'll be a, a, the first big step in, in launching this project is kind of looking at 
what's going on with our current ordinance um, that, that's an outside perspective uh, to that. So that'll be, I think, pretty exciting for your June update. Um, industrial districts, um, I think, Andy, I, I think we're hoping to bring that maybe this sometime, is that June or maybe July? It could be as early as June. We're still uh, in some of the um, progress of putting some of it together. We've had a couple other projects that have kind of uh, been pushed forward and we've been having to spend more time on those. So unfortunately for everything that gets moved up, we have to <laughs> make some shift, shift things back. But uh, I hope to have something back by um, either June or July. Okay. So, and one of the questions I had about that, uh, Director Gillies, is so whether it's June or July, is, is your objective to actually have a draft ordinance or are you, would you first be bringing back some of your research and your study and you know, how you plan I to? I think it'll be more of a kind of maybe a conceptual draft of what it, how it's laid out and maybe not all the details of it and then bring it back the next month as to if, after we get kind of a consensus from you all that you feel that that's the direction you, you, you'd like us to continue with, that we'll kind of uh, add um, more details to it and then bring it back the next month. Okay. Okay, and then of course the two code amendments that you passed uh, last month in April are heading to the board, so that's the Route 1 geography for the overlay, um, and the family subdivision, the RPAD determinations there, both should be going to the board, I think, this month. Um, and then, of course, Midlothian Design District. Uh, yay, we're hearing that tonight, so hopefully that'll, that'll go through fine, and then we'll send that up to the board and, and get moving on other things. So, and then you see the other projects there. You know, there may be other ordinance things that, that slip in uh, in between, but that's, this is kind of where we are right now. Um, is there anything else you want to add to the ordinances, Andy? Um, no, I, I think just go ahead and finish. And okay. For the comp plans, um, again, uh, just to remind you all, my team has picked up some of the zoning case work uh, to help us through this transition time as the zoning team gets its staffing back up to speed again. Um, I think we are phasing out of that, so we're ready to pick up on uh, the projects that were paused a little bit. So I did want to touch base a little bit with you all on those revised timelines for those. So the Midlothian Implementation Committee, that's going to continue on with Frank um, and, and Mr. Sloan. Uh, looking at, though, we have some other projects coming in there. Um, comp plan modernization, that's mine. Um, I've had to put that on hold uh, to focus on some other things, but I'm hoping to bring something to you all this summer uh, regarding the draft land uses there. Again, we're, we're working right now internally with some of the staff to make sure the land use changes we're recommending aren't going to cause a problem to the infrastructure systems that we have. Genito 288 uh, should track the same, that we should be bringing something to you all in the next couple of months. Um, that's Ms. Fry's district. Um, you saw a little bit today for the excitement going on with the, uh, the, the water attraction. I don't know, it's not water park anymore, so water attraction, I'll call it. Um, so again, I think that, that area has a lot of energy going on. The county has uh, made some uh, progress in acquiring some properties around there, so uh, it'll be very exciting to see what the next life for that area is. Uh, Roseland, uh, Drew is working on that project. We are looking at um, kind of keeping the whole of that development together while revising some of the standards and infrastructure expectations there. Um, I'm, I'm, I think we're pretty confident we can get an overlay in front of you all hopefully later this summer uh, that will uh, be something that the property owners have all kind of signed off on um, that will take us to the next phase of the Roseland project. So hopefully that, that goes well. And then the affordable housing strategy is the main uh, one I'm working on right now. Um, Dr. Hilton and Mr. Sloan uh, are commissioner leaders on that one. Uh, where we have left it is that uh, we have reviewed the tools available to us in Chester Hill County by the state of Virginia. Uh, we are putting those together uh, internally as staff as to what they might look like uh, so that the committee can review them. And with the ultimate goal of that committee making a presentation to the Board of Supervisors hopefully this summer, and then seeing where the board might be on some of those uh, tools and give us feedback so then we can proceed with fleshing out that strategy. So we're hopeful and excited to, to get that feedback, but right now we're in the kind of the building phase of some of those tools uh, to craft them to Chesterfield. So again, uh, for you all, we'll probably be doing 221 meetings with the board and commission uh, you know, sometime this summer once we get the committee's buy off on, on those projects, then. And we'll see what our next steps are from there. Commissioner. 
Steve, and, and I apologize for asking this question. Are, are they supposed to say summer of 20? Never mind. Nope, it's next couple of months. That's we're, we're shooting high, yeah. Not next year, yeah, this year. Yeah, COVID <laughs> will do that to us, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then I think I think my team, if if we're successful in getting these these dates kind of aligned and and meeting those goals, I think we'll have another discussion with you all um, as well as uh, the department leadership about which projects you want us to tackle next. Um, there's a lot of activity going around uh, along in the uh, Magnolia Green area, um, on, on the Western Hull Street area, on the Western 60 area. So. Uh, we might engage you all again in the summer about what our next focus should be as far as the special area plans or specific area plans um, and see where, where the need is there next. So I think once we get through some of these projects we got right now, I think we'll be looking to you all for guidance as to what rises to the top for you all, um, where you're seeing pressures and, and where our long range planning efforts could be helpful in guiding zoning and development requests uh, for you all. Of course, we always have our opinions as staff um, but we'll we'll be curious to see where you all are getting pressure and inquiries too. So, I think that's where we're, we are right now, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Sloan, I'll get one out this time. Um, with with the comprehensive plan modernization, uh, is it fair to assume that that is addressing the public facilities chapter? No, that that'll be a separate project. Um, and if that's something that the commission's interested in, we can add that to the list and initiate that one. I know we've been looking at that for a bit. Uh, and again, we don't necessarily need to debate it today, but I, I will throw my two cents worth out. Next summer, there's gonna be a bond referendum where the citizens are voting on certain types of schools and so forth. I think it is essential, absolutely essential, that our comprehensive plan and that chapter absolutely encompass and allow for what citizens are being asked to vote on. So I think if we back up from that, if they're voting on that in June, it's going out into the public into the spring, I think we need to be in a position to have something to the Board of Supervisors, call it the end of this year, so that you know it's kind of blue sky, there aren't people coming back and saying why are we voting on something that the comp plan hasn't been addressed and plenty of time for public hearings and that kind of stuff. So um, I think like some of these, and I know Director Gillies mentioned, you know, there's some projects kind of being forced upon you guys to have to address sooner rather than later. And I certainly get that being one of the problem children in that camp. Um, but I, I, I do think that's one that we need to, we need to get in the loop because there's a firm due date where folks can be voting on that stuff. I agree with you 100%. And if you remember the last bond referendum we did in 13, uh, we had the comp plan done in 12, and that comp plan outlined those schools that need to be revitalized, and then the bond followed suit and paid for those schools. So that alignment was really, I think, helpful to the citizens. So I think you're exactly right on that. Yes. <laughs> and, and so, um, Mr. Hodge, following up on that, and your experience with that, what kind of timing should we be backing it out to uh, add the facilities plan to our work program? Should uh, we be making a motion to do that today? I, I think you can go ahead and do that today because I think, you know, we, we've been looking at this um, since the comp plan was adopted in 19. If you remember when we did that update, we had done a lot of work on the public facilities chapter. Um, and then there was, I think, some disagreement higher than us, and we kind of left the school section specifically alone in that update. And so we, we know it's been hanging out there, and we've done a lot of work on that. Of course, we have a new administration on the school side, so I think if you were to kick that off today, that, that'll allow us to start having those conversations with the school division and other public facility departments and make sure that uh, their ideas for this upcoming bond referendum are encapsulated in the comprehensive plan uh, amendment that we bring to you all. Well, considering uh, what I've heard, I'm prepared to make a motion that we add the public facilities chapter of the land use plan to the work program. Second. Is there, uh, there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion about adding it to our work plan, work program? Okay, no discussion. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you call the vote? Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. 
Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous. That motion does pass. Thank you. And we'll thank get to you work. for doing that. Thank you. The only other thing I would just mention on the work program is, uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of activity recently on the Route 1 area, and um, we, we are in the process of getting uh, one minor adjustment to the Route 1 uh, residential overlay done uh, to the board um, next week. Um, but I think it's come to our attention that there are a few more adjustments within that overlay are, are necessary to, to be made uh, soon. And then I, I think tonight at six o'clock uh, meeting, uh, Mr. Sloan may be bringing before you uh, a request for initiation of a zoning ordinance amendment uh, to that uh, residential, uh, J, the Route 1 residential overlay. So we'll, we'll be bringing that forward to you uh, tonight, hopefully. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, um, unless there's anything else from the commissioners or Director Gillies at this time, we can recess and uh, till five o'clock in the executive uh, session room for dinner. Good evening. A call to order the May 18, 2021 Planning Commission public hearing. The COVID situation continues to evolve uh, with new guidance and recommendations coming from CDC um, that are currently being monitored by the county. But for the time being, the county continues to follow the same special pro arrangements that we have had for in-person meetings for the last several months. All citizens entering the building are required to wear a mask and will be asked basic health questions. There are social distancing requirements and a limit on the number of persons who can be permitted in the public meeting room at a time. Later, Director Gillies will explain the meeting procedures and the arrangements that have been made for in-person comments this evening, as well as comments from citizens who did not feel comfortable of being here. We do appreciate your cooperation and your understanding uh, as the county works to keep everyone safe. We'll begin uh, with an invocation, and I will now ask my fellow commissioners to please join me in a moment of silence to reflect upon the tenets of our faith and seek guidance that our deliberations will reflect both in thought and deed the values of our beliefs as we consider the matters before us this evening. Amen. Would you now please stand and join me in a Pledge of Allegiance to our flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we we'll begin this evening by asking the commissioners if you have any changes to the agenda. And I believe we do have one, Commissioner Sloan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, I would ask, um, I move that we add to the agenda as item number 19B, um, consideration of a code amendment to the Jeff Davis overlay. There is a motion to add this code amendment. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? No discussion. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. 
Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you. So that item will be added as 19B. That brings us to our first uh, citizen comment period on unscheduled matters. And I'll ask Director Gillies if you would please explain that period and uh, its procedures. Okay. Um, go ahead and do the review uh, meeting procedures at this time. Uh, for the citizen comment period. Okay. Um, we have modified our typical meeting procedures tonight uh, on a controlled basis. The Planning Commission will be hearing live in-person public comments for citizens who have signed up tonight. Um, in addition to this live in-person public comments this evening, we've established a special public comments portal on our uh, Chesterfield Planning Department website and have been taking citizen comments on all public hearing items on the, tonight's agenda since May 11th, 2021. In addition to the portal, we received telephone messages and emails specifically directed to the planning department. All of these comments, the portal, the telephone messages, and the emails you hear tonight were submitted by 5 p.m. Monday, September 17th, 2021. These specific public comments may involve the services and policies and affairs of the county government regarding the planning or land use issues. These comments, however, may not address any matter of business that is subject to the commission's agenda this evening. Uh, we had one comment on the portal. Uh, a Mr. Carl Schwendeman uh, made a comment to uh, like to see the design of sidewalks along uh, US 60, Bull Ridge, and Carter Colony become more defined and separated between the curb and the actual sidewalk with a 20 foot space in between those. Um, with that, uh, we uh, may have some speakers that have signed up tonight uh, to speak, but that was the only comment we had on the portal. Each speaker will get three minutes to make their comments. Thank you, Director Gillies. Um, I don't see anybody that signed up, but I will ask, is there anyone present who would like to speak about any matter that is not on today's agenda? Anything that's not scheduled? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone, so we can move on and proceed with Director Gillies giving us a review of the meeting procedures. Okay, thank you. Um, we have modified um, the typical meeting procedures tonight, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we will be hearing live in-person public comments from citizens who have signed up tonight. Um, please follow the instructions of the deputy sheriffs who will be helping in this regard. In addition to the computer security and health issues, no submittal of flash drives or documents shall be permitted at the meeting tonight. To provide more opportunity for public comments during these difficult times, the planning, commit, the planning department has established a special public comments portal on our Chesterfield Planning Department website and has been taking citizen comments on all public hearing items on tonight's agenda since May 11th. In addition to the portal, we received telephone messages, emails uh, specifically directed to the Planning Department. All of these comments, portal, telephones, and emails you hear tonight were submitted uh, by 5 p.m. Uh, Monday, uh, May 17th. The Planning Commission makes recommendations for conditional uses, conditional use plan developments, and rezoning cases. In a case that is, if a case is withdrawn, there is no further public hearings regarding that request. If the Commission recommends approval or denial of any of these items tonight, the item will be forwarded to the Board of Supervisors for final action. Following tonight's meeting, you may obtain information on the date and time of the Board of Supervisors public hearing on a conditional use, conditional use plan development and rezoning request by calling 751-4700 and entering the last three digits of the case number. Thank you, Director Gillies. So that brings us now to the public hearing where we consider requests for withdrawals, deferrals, 
consent cases where the applicant agrees with the recommendations and we're not aware of opposition. Our discussion cases where the applicant does not accept the recommendation or there is public opposition and then code amendments. All these items except for withdrawals are subject to a public hearing. All citizen comments received through the portal have been given to each of the commissioners. These comments are part of the record and can be viewed on the planning page of the Chesterfield County website at the bottom of the upcoming meeting section. There are no withdrawals this evening, so we can begin with the deferral requests. And I believe we have two cases requesting deferral. And Mr. Donahoe, will you please present those? Yes, absolutely. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission, uh, Director Gillies. Uh, we will begin this evening with the deferral items, of which there are two. Uh, we have case 20 SN 0608 in the Matoka Magisterial District. This is the Oasis Park LLC requesting rezoning from Agricultural A to Residential Townhouse RTH District for the conditional use to continue to, to permit an existing communications tower and a conditional use plan development to permit exceptions to ordinance requirements and development standards. The district commissioner is recommending deferral to the July 20th, 2021 meeting to allow for additional time for the applicant to finalize the application. And the applicant consents to this deferral. Next case is 21 SN 0575. It's in the Dale Magisterial District. It's McShay Communities requesting rezoning from Agricultural A to Residential R12 on a 11.2 acre property located in the southeast corner of the intersection of Salem Church Road and Kingsland Road. The district commissioner is recommending deferral to the July 20th, 2021 meeting, and the applicant consents to this deferral. Thank Those you. are your two deferral requests this evening. Thank you. Do commissioners have any questions about either of these cases being deferred or requested to be deferred? Um, do either of the applicants want to make any comments about the deferral request? Well, I will open the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Donahoe, did staff receive any citizen comments about the deferral of these two requests? We did receive one, uh, one uh, message in the portal um, for, the, for case 20SN0608, that's the Oasis Park case. Again, referencing uh, the, the commentary essentially was regarding um, sidewalks in, in, the, in the general area. Um, and then for the McShay case, that's 21SN0575, we did have one email there uh, regarding traffic issues associated with new development. Okay, thank you. But neither one objected to the deferral. No, ma'am. Okay. Um, so we do have a, a public hearing that's been opened and do any of the commissioners have any comments that they would want to report from citizens about the deferral of either of these cases? Okay. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone present who would like to speak about the deferral of either of these cases? Seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. As there was no opposition to the deferral of these cases, they may both be voted on using a block vote. So do I have a motion to defer case 20SN0608 in the Matoka District Oasis Park LLC to 72021 and case 21SN0575 in the Dale District, McShay Communities Incorporated to 72021. Do I have a motion? So moved, Madam Chair. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion about the deferral of these cases? No. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you. And 
glad you stayed at the podium. Uh, we're moving right on to our consent uh, agenda. And this is where the applicant does accept the recommendation and we're not aware of any opposition. I believe there are four cases listed as consent and Mr. Donahoe will be presenting those as well. Yes, Madam Chair, we do have four this evening uh, that we've received confirmation from all of the applicants uh, presented here on the consent agenda that they agree with the staff recommendation as well as the conditions. I additionally, I wanted to express that we have not received opposition uh, regarding any of the consent items as of 5 p.m. May 17th, 2021. So starting off, we, the first case on the consent agenda is 20SN0516. It's in the Dale Magisterial District. The Chesterfield County Board of Supervisors requests conditional use to permit a private school and a conditional use plan development to permit exception, exceptions to the ordinance requirements and development standards on a 34.61 acre property addressed at 6511 Belmont Road. Staff recommends approval subject to the conditions in the staff report. Moving on, case 21 SN0546 in the Midlothian Magisterial District. Westchester Towns Development Company LLC requests amendment of zoning approval of case 06 SN0191 to permit a residential townhouse development in a general industrial I-2 district. The property is located on 13 and a half acres within the Westchester Common Center with frontage along Watkins Center Parkway. The applicant is proposing a residential townhouse development consisting of 210 units with design considerations addressed through landscaping, lighting, and quality building materials complementary to the existing development. Staff recommends approval sub to, subject to the conditions within the staff report. Next case on the consent agenda is case 21 SN0589. This is in the Bermuda Magisterial District. Cassie Pamignano requests rezoning of, uh, from residential R7 to corporate office O2 on a half acre piece of property known as 381500 Road. The applicant is proposing to convert an existing single family dwelling into an office for a home health care company. The applicant does not have plans to reside on the premises. Staff does recommend approval subject to the conditions contained in the staff report. And last case is 21 SN 0619. This is in the Natoka Magisterial District. This is the Clover Hill Assembly of God requesting conditional use to expand the existing private school and child care uses and allow a conditional use plan development to permit exceptions to development standards on the entire 12.96 acre property. The property is zoned Agricultural A and is addressed at 12310 Bailey Bridge Road. The existing private school and child care facilities, uh, facility operates in conjunction with the church on the property. Uh, the applicant plans to con continue the temporary use of three existing and add one new modular classroom to the, to the property. There's an exception. Uh, an exception is also requested for two existing gravel parking areas located in the rear of the existing church buildings. Uh, the applicant requests to retain these gravel parking areas for, for overflow parking associated with the church, the daycare use, as well as the private school. Staff does recommend approval of this request subject to conditions contained in the staff report. That concludes your consent agenda. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do commissioners have any questions for Mr. Donahoe about any of the cases on the consent agenda so far? Uh, would any of the applicants like to speak about any of these cases? Good evening, members of the commission. My name is Dave Anderson. Can I take the mask yes, off? You this can. is great. <laughs> um, I don't need to unnecessarily extend this meeting, and I don't need to speak about the case. Well, I, I represent Clover Hill Church, and I just wanted to mention that too often government tends to get bashed for the things they do wrong, and I wanted to come up here and just commend the staff and what they did on this process and this project, doing the right thing at all times, and I particularly want to call out Ray Cash, Joe Feast, and particularly Ryan Ramsey, who is the case manager here. You, you really got it right, and they really deserve um, the public kudos that they've got in, in carrying this process through. So I do appreciate it. They deserve to be known publicly for that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Hi, my name is Cliff Williams. I'm the head of school at Richmond Christian School. We're the ones that 
sponsored by the County Board of Supervisors. And again, we want to thank you for working with us. I want to single out Harold Ellis, who worked with us, and uh, thank Mr. Holland, who sponsored us. And uh, we look forward to uh, serving Chesterfield County in many, many years coming. We're getting ready to celebrate 70 years, by the way. So thank you all very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, any other applicant? Uh, and do um, Director Gillies, do you have a question to ask I, of any of the applicants? I do. Um, if I could have the representative for 21 SN 0546, the Westchester Towns Development, step forward. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Mr. Gillies. Uh, we are in agreement that the proffers are reasonable okay. under state law. Thank you. Read thank my you. mind. <laughs> okay. Th thank you, Mr. Geiger. Um, I'm going to open the public hearing now. Um, Mr. Donahoe, did you have, you already commented on citizen comments, I believe. Did you? So as far as what we received? Any of the, yes. yes. So uh, for case 21, SN0546, that's the Westchester Towns case, uh, we did get one, uh, one comment, uh, again, regarding sidewalks generally in the area, but specifically uh, along uh, Route 60, Midlothian Turnpike. But again, no opposition. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do commissioners have any citizen comments to report aside from what's already been reported? No. Um, this is a public hearing, and I um, want to recognize anyone present who would like to speak about any one of these cases. Uh, I did see on the sign-in sheet there was, a, I believe, a Stephanie Bauer who had an interest in the uh, Westchester Towns case. Uh, would Ms. Bowers like to speak? My comment is I just wanted on page 10, the school numbers, I just wanted those checked for Midlothian Middle School to see if they are correct. Okay. It's on page 10. Um, well, just let me clarify one thing. Um, one of the things I want to clarify is whether you're opposed to the case or not or whether you just have a question about the case. Um, I would just like to know that we're making informed decisions with the numbers of the, the enrollment in the school and capacity. To make sure the numbers are presented accurately. Those, those are the numbers that we got from the school district staff uh, in reference to um, <clears throat> the, uh, their, their estimated um, um, occupancy that could occur in, in those, those units that is uh, uh, an est uh, estimate that we've been doing uh, using the new Stratus system, and uh, they are accurate from what we are, from all information we have okay. at this point. So if it's a current enrollment of 1,572 and a capacity of 1,317, that to me indicates that's over 100% capacity, not 84%. Ms. Bauer, would you, at this point, we have that case on a consent agenda. Would you like for us to pull that case off and get a full presentation? Um, I would just like everyone to look at the numbers and make sure that they're represented accurately for the students. And as Director Gilley said, we get those numbers from the school uh, administration. We don't get them from the applicant. We actually get them from the school. Okay, so but we just mathematically, if you yeah, have I a high higher number than what Excuse capacity. Me. It seems like over 100% already. Excuse me, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, so this one is in the Midlothian District. So if it helps, the program capacity is not the design capacity, meaning that 
design capacity would be how many children can physically fit in the school. Program capacity is how many children can fit depending on which program is in which classroom. So the numbers look misleading, but it's because they're, they're measuring two different things. They're measuring the physical capacity versus the program capacity. All right, but the way you have it for the elementary school and the high school, the way that it looks to me like the division has been done in reverse. We'll, we'll take a look at that. Thank before you. it goes before the Board of Supervisors, we'll make sure that that number is accurate. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Bauer. Is there anyone else present that would like to speak to any of these cases that are listed on the consent <laughs> agenda? Seeing no one come forward, um, I will close the public hearing now. Uh, and as I don't believe there's any opposition, these four cases may be voted on with a block vote. Do I have a motion to recommend approval subject to the conditions of the following cases? Case 20SN0516 in the Dale District, Chesterfield County Board of Supervisors. Case 21SN0546 in the Midlothian District, Westchester Towns Development Company, LLC. Case 21SN0589 in the Bermuda District, Cassie Pomignano. And case 21SN0619 in the Matoica District, Clover Hill Assembly of God. Do I have a motion? I would like to make a motion to recommend approval for those four cases and add that for case 21SN056, the Westchester Towns development that we will also commit to looking into that 84% under percent program capacity for Midlothian Middle School before this goes to the board. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the vote? Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you. So that now brings us to our discussion cases. And as I said earlier, these are cases where the applicant does not agree with the staff's recommendations or there is public opposition to the case. We have five cases listed um, for discussion and each one of these cases will be heard individually and acted upon individually. The first case we have is case number 21SN0607 in the Clover Hill District, Village of Faith Ministries. And this is gonna be presented by Mr. Hosh. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission, Mr. Gillies. Tonight, uh, your first discussion case is 21SN0607 in Clover Hill. Village of Faith Ministries is requesting a conditional use to operate a tattoo shop in a C3 community business district. Um, so uh, it would occupy an existing retail space within the shopping center, uh, generally the General Forest Shopping Center. Uh, it's not a new construction, so it, it's a conditional use for existing retail. Uh, there are a couple of conditions that the applicant has agreed to that would uh, limit the operation of the business and keep it running with the applicant themselves. Um, staff recommends approval with the conditions. Um, just to kind of go through some of the issues of the case, um, again, this is an existing shopping center uh, built in the 1980s um, that has seen a lot of transition and turnover since its prime. Uh, once housed a movie theater, now a church operates there. The retail strip that's out front of the building um, contains a variety of uses ranging from restaurants to personal services. Um, and so this use staff feels is in alignment with those other uses in the shopping center and maintains the occupancy of that center. Uh, the staff feels that one of the more detrimental things for a community is to have vacancies in the, in the commercial corridors uh, that can, may cause blight. Uh, you can see from the aerial photographs here, uh, again, it's an existing shopping center surrounded by other commercial uses, uh, as well as some industrial uses to the east along Speaks Drive. Uh, the land use plan for the area recommends continued commercial uses here, so this is not an area that we are trying to transition to a, a different um, use. Um, and again, you can see the light industrial employment uses right across the street uh, to the east. 
Some of the conditions offered in the case include limiting the hours of operations uh, uh, in the days of the week to 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, those are in line with the food line, which is the main tenant of the uh, uh, Genito uh, Forest Shopping Center. Uh, the conditional use, again, is limited to the operation of a tattoo shop. No other conditional uses would operate there. And it's granted only to the applicant in this case, which is uh, Mr. Hopkins, and is non-transferable and does not run with the property. So uh, should Mr. Hopkins decide to locate somewhere else um, or cease his business, um, the shopping center, you would, somebody else operating this use would need to come back through zoning uh, to operate a, another tattoo shop in the, in the shopping center. So given these conditions and, and uh, what's going on in the area, staff recommends approval of this request, again, subject to the three conditions in your staff report. Uh, and again, happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Do any of the commissioners have a question for Mr. Hosh? I actually do, but I'll give you all an opportunity first. Commissioner Hosh, Sorry. just a very quick question as it relates to the transferability. Was, is the transferability tied to um, even the sale of the business? So in other words, if he was to sell the business, does this, does this use go with the business? Do no, we, sir. Do, do we separate it, the person from the business? It, it's tied to the person. So in this case, Ian Hopkins is, is the person it's tied to. Should he move out of the space, um, then that conditional use goes away and it, it's no longer valid on the property. Okay. So if he was to sell his business, someone was to purchase the business from him, even if nothing changed on the door, that person would, the new owner would still need to come forward. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hosh, I, I wondered if you maybe, I don't know if your aerial would be the best way to show it, but um, can you clarify the distance that this particular shop would be located from any R-zoned district or residence, the closest residence? Can you estimate what that is? Yes, ma'am. So just to the uh, west and a little bit north of the General Forest Shopping Center is a relatively new townhouse development, uh, Genito Towns. Um, this use would be approximately 950 feet from the nearest townhome uh, in that area. Um, there are also single family residences up the, uh, the roadway there that's behind the shopping center. Um, that nearest residence is about 600 feet uh, or so from this business. But again, it's a different, different access point. Okay. and. The other clarification is that Mr. Hopkins would just be a tenant operating the business. He doesn't own the shopping center or have any interest in the property other than uh, as a tenant. Yes, correct, ma'am. Uh, Village of Faith is the church. They own the property. Uh, Mr. Hopkins would be a tenant of one of the retail spaces owned by the church. Uh, the other question I had is where would the parking be to serve this business? Uh, the parking, it would be the existing parking lot, which is out front of the uh, retail strip that's outlined on the aerial there, uh, just using the existing uh, parking lot that's there. Okay. Again, it used to be a movie theater, so it's quite an extensive parking lot uh, out front of the, of the main church. Okay. Um, those, those were all the questions I had, you know, at this time, so thank you for answering those. Um, is the applicant present, and would you like to speak? I'm Ian Hopkins. I'm applicant for the tattoo shop. Um, the parking lot question is it's directly right outside. Like we, there's not even a sidewalk you'd have to, to go to or anything. It is right there. Okay. Um, also, I've grown up in Chesterfield. I want to see a decent shop there. Um, I know there's concerns about the nature of the business itself. I've been doing it for nine years and tired of giving other people money, I want to be that guy. So this was my opportunity to do that. Do you have any questions for me personally? Um, I do not. Do any of the other commissioners have any questions for Mr. Hopkins? Uh, no, sir, we do not. And um, can, for the record, uh, ask you, do you agree with the conditions uh, that have been recommended? Yes. As even in what was given to me, like, hey, are these hours? I'm even going to be less hours than that. Okay. Is on that, that, it says 7 to 11, 
shop is 12 to 8. So it's, it's even less hours. Thank you. All right. I'm going to thank you for right. that. Thank and you. I will open the public hearing. Um, we did have several comments that were um, posted on the portal. Um, and those can be read verbatim by going to the planning department website to, to read them. But there were uh, three comments from residents that were concerned about the nature of a tattoo business and whether that business might affect their, their property values. Um, there were other comments that were lodged on the, the portal that were about the maintenance and the activities of the shopping center property itself, primarily the parking lot behind the church. Um, those, those issues are definitely beyond the control of Mr. Hopkins. He is merely a tenant in that property, not, not the landowner. Um, however, I would like to let folks know that those complaints have been forwarded to our code enforcement department and they are looking into those complaints. Uh, and I would encourage any of the citizens who have specific details or concerns about the activities on the parking lot behind the church to call code enforcement and that number is 748-1500. Um, but we are already looking into those complaints. Uh, that said, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone present who would like to speak to this case? Seeing no one, I will close um, the public hearing. Um, and as this case is in the Clover Hill District, it comes back to the commission for, for me. Um, I have reviewed the case, and I have reviewed the comments that were posted and, and the staff report, and um, I think there, the general concerns were primarily about whether it could affect property values, but if you look at where this business is, it has its own parking, its hours are, as presented, less than what the rest of the shopping center is. Um, the proximity Emity is not near residential property or residential zoned property even. Um, there's no vehicular connectivity between the residential neighborhood and this business. It is a C3 business, uh, the comprehensive plan type business, and the comprehensive plan does recommend the property for C3 uses. So for these reasons, I uh, do not feel that the business would have any kind of a negative impact on the surrounding properties. So I want to follow the staff's recommendation and move to recommend approval of case 21SN0607, subject to the conditions. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? I would just like to make a couple comments. Um, the tattoo industry is something that there seems to be a stigma over in society today. And um, from recent trips I've taken, the amount of people who get tattoos has gone from people looking to have full body coverage to those getting individual tattoos. And I think if people were to look into the tattoo industry as a whole, about 70 to 80% of the people getting tattoos go in for a single tattoo, they have it done and they move along. Those who spend the time and the money to get these large tattoos and large sleeves, that is not a cheap thing to do. An average tattoo of a sleeve could run you anywhere from $700 to $1,000. So um, one of the things I want to just say is the stigma of the tattoo industry is not one of those things people should really fear as much as they should take a look at the quality of the artisan that is out there working on these tattoos. So that, that being said, I just wanted to, to mention that. Thank you, Commissioner Owen. Any other comments or discussion? We have a motion and a second and no further discussion. So Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you. We can move now to our second um, discussion case, which is 
SN0527 in the Dale District, Kenneth Lanky, Linda Heithouse, and Simon Green. And this will be presented by Mr. Cash. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, and Mr. Gillies. Um, this case before you tonight um, is a case located in the Dale District. Um, it calls for a rezoning from Light Industrial I-1 to Agricultural A and Light Industrial I-1 on 21.43 acres um, with a CEPD or Conditional Use Plan Development to permit a contractor's office shop and storage yard on 13.4 acres and exceptions to development standards. In addition, there is a request for an exception to 1860 of the Utility Ordinance for connection to the public wastewater system. Um, the property is actually located in the, um, the re, uh, vicinity of the Chesterfield Airport, located uh, towards the end of uh, White Pine Road and a future um, RT, um, collector road extension as shown in the thoroughfare plan. So this is the aerial. Um, the comprehensive plan actually calls for this area to be industrial. Industrial could um, under that be a variety of different types of industrial uses, can be heavy industrial um, or the like. Um, with this proposal, we are proposing light industrial um, with a conditionally use plan development to allow the contractor's um, shop, office shop and storage yard. In addition, um, they would be asking exceptions in regards to paving standards. Um, it also limits the use um, the use of the contractor's office shop and storage yard to um, a single access currently from 8100 White Pond Road, which is the property that fronts directly upon White Pond. Um, they are providing for dedication of right of way uh, for the future thoroughfare plan road. Um, also conditions that provide that future accesses um, to any of these properties um, would have to go through approval of the transportation department. Um, again, the one exception to the I-1 uses is for the contractor's office shop and storage yard. The remainder of the property would be light industrial. Um, further request two, there is an exception to 1860 of the utility ordinance for connection to the public wastewater system. The applicant has proper conditions which limit the wastewater exception to the contractor's office shop and storage yard. It does require um, provisions of wastewater easements as necessary by the uh, deemed necessary by the utilities department, require, require future connection to the wastewater system should the property, um, should development occur or should the, the lines move within a certain distance of the, the property, and provide that use, um, the use connects to the public waste, oh, I'm sorry, water system and provides for a fire hydrant to be located along White Pine Road. Um, staff does recommend approval of request one. Um, as uh, based upon what the, the ordinance provides for, the utilities does recommend denial of request two. Um, and I believe the applicant um, is here tonight and staff's available for any questions. Do commissioners have any questions for Mr. Cash? Oh, Commissioner Hilton. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Cash, so the uh, all three lots in the uh, comprehensive plan are to be um, asserted at some point to be uh, industrial, correct? Uh, correct, so um, this, this actually consists of three parcels, um, one on which it would, would have the contractor shop and storage yard. Um, all of these would be light industrial and the current comprehensive plan does recommend industrial for the area. Any other questions from commissioners for Mr. Cash? No. Uh, would the applicant like to speak? Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Linda Heithouse, and I have been working with Ken Lanky and Simon Green, heading back here, who would like to put his shop there in the middle of this acreage um, for two plus years. <laughs> and um, I am very grateful to the folks in planning and zoning um, utilities right away, um, a variety of folks. Um, Garrett Hart, 
for helping us to get to this place. A lot of recommendations, various recommendations have been suggested along the way, which Simon Green has agreed to all of them. Um, and this area has been in the long-term comprehensive plan for Chesterfield, um, and we appreciate this consideration. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, do commissioners have any questions for the applicant? No, okay. I'll now open the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Cash, were there any citizen comments received about this case? We did receive, um, over the, the course of this, um, two emails as well as um, phone calls um, from an individual. Um, those um, emails have been forwarded to the commission, so you would be in your packet. Um, they are in regards to, um, I guess, concern about the potential change from agricultural to industrial land for the area. Um, um, questioning why we rezoned the entire section from A to, to industrial. Um, and also concerns about the proposed thoroughfare road um, that's on the, the comprehensive plan, thoroughfare plan, that uh, runs adjacent to and potentially through this Perkins property. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Hilton, do you have any additional citizen comments to report, or does that cover it? Is, is Ms. Ann here tonight? Okay. So I did receive an email and had a um, phone conversation with her in regards to her concerns, but I'll let her, um, if she's kind enough to, when the time is right, to um, tell us where her concerns are personally. Okay, I have opened the public hearing. Um, so is anyone present who would like to speak and to come to the podium and please give us your name? I am Ann Lanky. I live at 8401 Belmont Road in an area that is zoned agricultural. I have been living here since 1977 and the property that I live on shares a border with two of the three parcels that are being considered for rezoning. I don't have any objection to the project itself or the rezoning of the two parcels that have the white pine address, but I do object to rezoning of the parcel at 8205 Cogbill Road. The application for rezoning and conditional use does not give any justification or explanation as to why that third parcel should be rezoned. The former case manager of this project told me that light industrial is now so clean that there's no objection to mixing it in with residential. But I'm not sure how many people in this room would vote to put it on the property adjoining their houses. So I am requesting that the parcel, the third parcel that is not part of the current project on Cogbill Road not be rezoned to light industrial at this time, that it not be piggybacked on the White Pine properties. And if it's not possible to split that out the way the application is presented, I'm asking that it be that the whole case be tabled and that the application be resubmitted without the inappropriate parcel in it. Thank you. Incidentally, I'm trying to get the property that I live on into a conservation easement. Thank you, Ms. Lanky. Thank you very much. Do, unless the commissioners have any questions for Ms. Lanky? No? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak to this case? Um, seeing no one else, I'll close the public hearing and um, bring the, the case back to the commission. Uh, Commissioner Hilton. So um, <clears throat> I just want to thank the applicant, uh, the community that attended our community meeting, um, those who um, voiced some concerns. Um, I do want you to know that you were heard. Um, we, we looked at uh, each perspective uh, they came out from the case, and um, Mr. Cash and I did have extensive conversations throughout the case of, about it, 
Uh, Ms. Ann, I appreciate the phone call that we had uh, and the emails that we changed, exchanged. Really appreciate that. And so um, I just want to, guess I can make a motion now. If it's, uh, yes, sir. So I would, in, in light of the idea that it is in a comprehensive plan, I do make a motion that we um, change the zoning for the, these three parcels. And so, Commissioner Hilton, your motion would be to recommend approval of this case subject to the conditions? Right, outlined in the case from staff. Okay, thank you. There has been a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. And is there any discussion from the commission about the case? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the vote? Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, that brings us to our third discussion case, which is 21SN0548 in the Matoka District, Manage This LLC, and that is presented by Mr. Ellis. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the, of the commission. Um, this case, as stated, is 21SN0548. The applicants manage this LLC are requesting rezoning from agricultural to multifamily residential with conditional use plan development to permit exceptions to ordinance requirements and development standards. Subject property is located at the southwest corner of Woolridge and Otterdale Roads. The site is zoned agricultural and surrounding properties are zoned residential R12. As indicated on the aerial above, the property is mostly undeveloped except for a few single family homes which will be removed if the site is developed with the current request. The land use plan for the subject property indicates suburban residential which recommends two dwelling units per acre. A rezoning to residential multifamily is requested, which would permit construction of an age-restricted community with 194 units on 49.5 acres, which would result in a density of 3.9 units per acre. The, request, the requested density is a 95% increase from the comprehensive plan's recommendation of 2.0 units per acre. The proposed community, if approved, would consist of 84 quad homes and 110 townhomes up to, up to one and a half stories tall and a condominium ownership structure. Approximately 16 acres of land is provided as recreation area, which includes building setback areas, buffers, existing cemetery, park space, dog park, stormwater ponds, trails and walking areas, seating areas, and a clubhouse. All proposed units will have off-street parking, and additional on-street parking is provided in various locations throughout the community. Access to the site is provided from Otterdale and Woolridge Roads, with a future stub connection to the, uh, to the property north of the site. Exceptions to ordinance requirements are detailed in the report and are requested for driveways, pavement setbacks, building setbacks, reduction in distance between buildings, deviations to sidewalk and architecture requirements, and reduction in landscaping requirements. These are a number of slides that uh, I'll show you as we go of, of um, building elevations, conceptual elevations. The applicant's proffering that street-facing facades of each building in the aggregate shall have a minimum of 25% brick or stone masonry, but in no event shall a street-facing facade have less than 10% masonry. A minimum of two materials shall be used on any facade of all buildings, and premium vinyl is proposed. Additionally, hardscape driveways and front walks, foundation treatments, front yard landscaping requirements, and upgraded garage doors where visible from the street are proposed. A minimum dwelling size is proffered to be 1,500 square feet. The next few slides are elevations. With the Residential Suburban 1 Comprehensive Plan designation, as I mentioned, a maximum of 2.0 dwelling units is appropriate, as indicated in the comp plan, for residential development with a corresponding lot size of 12,000 to 25,000 square feet. The plan indicates that dwellings in smaller lots or condominiums may be appropriate if the above five circumstances exist, as illustrated on the screen. Staff believes that two of those five uh, circumstances are met, but had concerns about the remaining three. The first of the 
three concerns staff has is with the criteria development, design, and quality enhances the surrounding residential area. While the applicant's proffered conditions do require masonry, 10%, 25% in the aggregate, a minimum of two material types as well, it does not appear that the proposed units will enhance the surrounding area. Above are photos of existing homes on adjacent Bulger's Terrace Lane. As illustrated on those photos, significant masonry is found on many of the homes in the adjacent subdivision, as well as porches to break up the front facade, side load garages, and quality architectural features, which add variety and individuality of home elevations. While the product type being offered by the applicant in this case is not comparable to adjacent homes, design elements for the product type, type being proposed, which result in development more comparable to, or as the plan recommends, that enhances surrounding development, could be achieved with the applicant's application. Staff doesn't believe this criteria has, met, has been met. The second criteria staff has concerns with is compensating usable open space that maintains the overall density recommendations. In this case, at a density that's 95% higher than the comprehensive plan's recommendation, at 3.9 dwelling units per acre, acre as opposed to two, with non-traditional recreation and open space areas, for example, building setbacks in, as being counted as recreation space, it does not appear that this, that this requirement or recommendation of the plan is met. And then the third criteria staff has concerns with is quality design standards, which could include the provision of sidewalks, street trees, site and individual lot landscaping, quality and variety of architectural design, garage or orientation and hardscape driveways. While the applicant is providing sidewalks, street trees are not provided. Proffered foundation plannings are included with the request. However, as previously discussed, the level of architecture being, uh, architectural quality being provided does not complement the surrounding area. Further, the applicant has not proffered garage orientation requirements. Staff does not believe that this requirement has been met either. So for, these, uh, for the reasons I just outlined, including the density being proposed, which is 95% higher than the comprehensive plan recommendation, and concerns pertaining to quality of product being proposed and open space provided, staff uh, does recommend denial of this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Do commissioners have any questions for uh, Mr. Ellis at this time? Commissioner Sloan. Madam Chair, I've got just a couple questions. So help, help, me, help me understand in this case, um, I've heard in your comments a couple times that included in recreational space are cemeteries, BMPs, and so forth. I, I don't see anything in their proffered condition or anything in the case that specifies that those are amenities or are being included in recreational space for this project. I understand that you may be including open area in a density equation, but you know, you know, square footage for density calculations to then represent those as recreational spaces, I'm, I'm concerned about that. How's a cemetery being included in a recreational space for this project? So on the comprehensive, I'm oh, sorry, on the conceptual master plan, which I believe we pulled up, the applicant has detailed the areas that they're counting towards recreations. I believe it's recreation space. Let me double check that. Yeah, recreation space. And so they've done a detail of what they're considering to meet that requirement. For example, I wish we could use that up there, but let's see if this is a four now. So along Woolridge, So what Steve's about to point out are some of the areas I talked about, which are building setbacks that they're counting along Woolridge and Otterdale. The cemetery is shown as, as open space. Um, so no, the calculations that we're talking about are not considered for density. But when I say, you know, there is a, a I guess I've implied a lack of open space, it's because of the areas that the applicant is including in their open space that, that we've made those statements. Does, does that answer your question? I do. I just I, w I just want us to be careful because I, I want to just make sure that staff isn't taking the position that, I mean, it's one thing to call something open space, but their proffers are very clear as to what they've listed as amenities as being a clubhouse with a park area, other park areas, walking trails shall be provided generally on the conceptual layout, 
other amenities to be provided, including a dog park, hardscape patio area, seated and outdoor cooking areas. I'm assuming those areas that they've proffered aren't part of a cemetery, correct? That's correct. So I guess what I, the areas that I was talking about are the recreation areas, which are a total of 16 acres on the comprehensive plan. There are separate amenities, which you're right, are proffered. So they're not considering the cemetery, I guess, as a recreation area, you're correct. So, I mean, as an amenity, excuse me. So what percentage is required of a property like this to have green space on our ordinances? Is there a certain percentage number that is a minimum percentage? At the time of site plan, based on the acreage provided, they would need to have five acres, plus or minus, of so, common area. So Mr. Ellis, would, would the areas that are referred to in the proffer that talks about the amenities, would that area be above and beyond what is required by the ordinance for common area, or would that be uh, part of meeting that common area requirement for the 10%? I'm looking at that proffer right now. I believe it's number 19. It, it is. So some of the items that are listed in this amenity proffer are included in the calculation on the conceptual open, uh, conceptual layout plan as recreation area, but not all of them. But the, the language of the proffer explains how it's being amenitized to make it usable common space, common area? That's correct. But, but the applicant has not asked for an exception to that common area requirement. Correct. Okay, so at site plan, they will have to um, provide the acreage to meet that 10% common area. That's correct, and staff has actually looked at the conceptual layout plan that we have, and we do believe that that requirement will be met at the time of site plan. Okay. Commissioner Sloan. Yeah. Harold, you, you, you've mentioned that the project fails to meet on uh, staff's opinion. Um, the quality materials found in surrounding um, you know, neighboring projects. Can you be more specific as, again, when I read the proffered conditions and the requirements for brick, um, high quality vinyl as defined as 0.044, brick veneer, stone, what, 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 quali what materials from a quality and durability standpoint do you feel that this project is missing that can be found in adjacent neighborhoods? Well, I think the first thing that I would point out is the quantity of masonry product in the adjacent neighborhood versus the proposed neighborhood. We're looking at 10 with an aggregate of 25 in the proposed neighborhood. The adjacent neighborhoods, I don't have the exact number, but I did do a windshield survey and they're significantly, they have a significantly higher percentage of masonry. And it's not just that, it's also the, the elevations of the home have different design requirements such as front porches, side load garage requirements and things like that that are not proposed with this development. I, I understand there, there may be a difference on design. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need to have that conversation. I'm more concerned with, with the quality and substance of materials. It is a condominium project, right? Yes. And, and we can phone a friend on this one, but the, the applicant, so in a condominium project, it is up to the, the association for all of the exterior maintenance on this, on this facility, on this project, right? Uh, typically speaking, yes. Okay, so to the extent that a, that, that a, prod, a, a product may, be, may, may not be as high a quality the maintenance requirements will be higher, but yet that's the burden of the, the condominium association to address, correct? Right. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioners have any questions for Mr. Ellis at this time? Okay, thank you, Mr. Ellis. And now we'll ask if the applicant is present and would like to speak.
Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Jeff Geiger here on behalf of the applicant, um, Boone Homes. Um, Boone Homes is the contract purchaser of the land that we are uh, discussing this evening. Um, I think Mr. Ellis did a good job uh, giving you an overview of the project, um, the elements that are um, included within the project. And I wanted to take this opportunity to explain uh, the engagement that we have had uh, with our neighbors and how that has uh, been an important part of this case. Uh, could we go to the next slide, Steve? Um, Boone started this project by evaluating uh, the needs of Chesterfield County, uh, in particular the need for um, housing for those who are 55 and older, uh, recognizing that the county is placing a priority on providing a mixture of housing uh, and encouraging uh, folks who may be aging in place uh, in homes that they are no longer no longer um, suitable, doesn't provide that first floor living that they are, that um, seniors are looking for, have them up, give them an opportunity to, uh, buy, to move into an age appropriate home within their community and then free up uh, a, a more appropriate home for a family uh, that has children. Um, thus creating a very healthy housing cycle uh, within this area of the county. Um, knowing this, um, having this, Knowing this demand was in place uh, was a need that, that uh, could be addressed. They began working on a community vision. Um, it would be age restricted, both by proffer uh, and in the land records. Uh, they wanted to create a low maintenance, walkable uh, living community. Uh, they are going to be uh, designing this to be handicapped adaptable, uh, both the community and the homes. And they wanted to create a quiet village setting uh, with low traffic counts. This would create the security and peace of mind that att attract residents to these types of communities. Next slide, please. Uh, within this um, vision, uh, they went and had uh, multiple meetings uh, with our neighbors uh, before filing the application. Uh, as a part of these meetings, they presented the details of this community along with the vision I just shared. As I mentioned, as a part of the details that we shared with our neighbors, uh, that it would be age restricted, um, that residents would be an active and productive part of the community, um, and that many of the residents uh, in Chesterfield County are looking for these types of homes uh, in order to suit the needs that they have for single, le single level living and low maintenance housing. And we will also hope to attract um, empty nesters who are interested in moving closer to family members um, in our, who are currently living in our community so they can be closer to their grandchildren. We also shared the layout uh, for the new community that's shown on this slide and the one that Mr. Ellis reviewed with you. As a part of these meetings before we filed the application, uh, if we go to the next one, Steve, we asked our neighbors what were, what were their concerns with development of this property? What did they want to see? And what was of utmost importance to them was the ability to provide a buffer along the shared boundary line. Uh, this is the boundary line that's shared with the single family homes uh, in Wexley. And on this slide, um, we developed a requirement that, a, that the utility easement that has to go through the buffer will go through it in a way that is perpendicular. We appreciate uh, working with um, the uh, Public Utilities Department uh, to allow us to do this in this fashion and to work with us on specific screening uh, that will be planted along this easement in order to continue to block uh, the view shed uh, rather than having a straight corridor uh, through the buffer. This will provide the screening of the community that our neighbors were looking for. In addition, uh, we learned that um, an easement, a public easement, that is on the two lots uh, in the middle of this slide uh, that you could see at the bottom of the slide, does have some improvements owned by uh, some homeowners. And so my client agreed to use boring, uh, the technology of boring, rather than trenching to install a sewer line. Uh, that boring will occur in order to avoid um, disturbing the improvements that are within this easement. Again, we appreciate uh, the Department of Utilities working with us on this aspect. Can we go to the next slide? With this community, um, 
we believe that um, our neighbors' quality of life uh, and the surrounding area will be enhanced. Residents will average four to five vehicle trips per day as compared to eight to 10 trips that a traditional single family detached home uh, would create if this property was developed exactly as set forth in the land use plan. These types of homes will have fewer occupants and many residents will only have a single car resulting in lower traffic. In addition, we have specifically proffered that no school aged children uh, can live in these homes, thus having no impact on schools in the area. These elements of this community were important to uh, our neighbors uh, as they continue to understand the development of the property and the community that would, be con that would be constructed on the property. As we worked with staff, um, we understand that you know, they are um, comparing uh, this community to the community that's uh, immediately adjacent. We would ask the Planning Commission to consider that the area is greater uh, than just our immediate neighbors. Um, communities within the area uh, that are of similar quality or um, ones where this community will exceed uh, the quality uh, include Jordan Crossing, Cosby Village, Greenwich Walk, and Livingston Apartments. So we believe that the surrounding area will be enhanced uh, for the reasons that were attractive to our neighbors. Uh, for the reasons that will enhance the area around us. And we have um, included a variety of design and quality assurances within the case. These include the buffers for the neighbors that they had requested, more common area than required in any R district uh, within the current ordinance. The clubhouse with a pool is provided. Pocket parks and dog park will be provided. Quality architectural features are provided. Side loaded garages for the quads are provided. Landscaping for buildings uh, along the street and then on the site are also provided. Hardscape driveways are also provided. We believe that if you look at this case from a holistic approach, recognizing that the land use plan is a guide, um, that, and also recognizing that there are other ways to have less of an impact on the surrounding area um, using different type of product or community design than intended with the original uh, land use plan, you would agree with us that the density and the condominium community that is proposed um, meets, the, um, is a, uh, meets the standard for, a, uh, for providing for a higher density uh, community. The design quality is provided uh, there's a less, with this new community, there will be less impactful use with a greater benefit to the county. And we've also listened to our neighbors in creating a project that will complement um, and work with their concerns and address their concerns. If we could go to the next slide, Steve, one more. Um, just for clarification for the commission's benefit, um, Mr. Ellis did show um, an old elevation uh, that was focused more on a street with homes on the side. Uh, that was replaced, um, and um, these are the elevations of the quads uh, that are proffered. Uh, if we could go to the next one, next one. And then, uh, as Mr. Ellis showed you, uh, these are the proffered elevations for the attached villas. Um, can we go back to the layout? Uh, just to address the comments on the cemetery, um, it is on the property. Um, I've worked with projects uh, that have cemeteries on them. You can either forget them or you can incorporate them into your design and recognize that they are there, both for the purpose of the family members who want to have access to them, uh, to visit them, and then those who may want to walk by and learn the history uh, and do some research in terms of who is buried there. Uh, for that purpose, uh, we took the approach that it was more about engaging and incorporating um, that into the design of the community, and that is why you see a uh, pedestrian path that leads up to it, uh, circles around it, and then connects out to the sidewalk that will be provided along Woolridge and Otterdale Road. Uh, the um, BMPs um, are part of our uh, common area calculations as allowed under the ordinance 
uh, where they are designed um, as a uh, design feature uh, for the for the project. In over in uh, total, we do have 16 acres of common area, uh, which is three times the amount required under the RMF zoning ordinance. With that, I'd be glad to answer uh, any questions that, that the commission may have. Um, thank you, Mr. Geiger. Uh, I have a question. Do you have uh, any questions, uh, Mr. Owens, Commissioner Sloan? You can go first, yes. Uh, Mr. Geiger, uh, in, just in reference to the BMPs, uh, is it intended for those to be wet, wet ponds or, or dry BMPs? They will be wet ponds. Um, we are required to have a uh, fountain uh, within them, uh, and then there are walking paths uh, along them as well. So they are being considered as a true water feature to the development? Correct. Thank you. Um, Mr. Geiger, one of the questions I had about your proffers uh, relates to the access uh, from the property to Otterdale Road. The way it's worded, it says it's limited to one full access. Um, I'm concerned if that would open the door for an additional access when the intent, I think, is just to limit it to one access. Uh, I see. So concern that a right in, right out could be added because it doesn't specifically say one access only, which shall be full access. Correct. Uh, the applicant's intent is only for one entrance, one access onto Otterdale. Um, it, I would be glad to clean that up uh, with better drafting uh, before the board's consideration. To, to clarify that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Geiger about the case? Okay. Yeah, I um, have one question for Mr. Geiger, uh, do you believe that the proffers you're offering tonight to be, on this case, to be reasonable in accordance with state law? We do. I do think, you know, part of this case, you know, and there was some confusion as to recreational area versus common area, a lot of terms being thrown around. I mean, I, I think it boils down to uh, Mr. Geiger's taking a, a bit more of a liberal definition of what he thinks the common area is versus what staff feels it is. and. I think for the purposes of this case, he seems to have met the, the, the minimum requirement of that common area of five acres or so. Uh, he's claiming 16. So I, I think you know part of this is, well, is what we normally work out at the site plan level as to what's really uh, allowable in, in reference to uh, being counted as common area. And we are having uh, discussions uh, internally as well as with uh, some of the developers and home builders in the area to try to um, simplify and, and clarify some of that definition. And ho hopefully we won't have this kind of um, debate on, on what common area really is. Th thank you for those comments, Director Gillies. Um, and, and I would want to affirm that if this case is approved, in no way does it um, remove the discussion or the um, calculation of what the common area is going to be at the time of site plan. That still remains to be worked out between um, what the ordinance requires and what the applicant is including in their plan. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing. Um, Mr. Ellis, did we get any staff get any comments about uh, citizen comments about this case? No, I received one informational call. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Owens, do you have any additional comments to report? We did, get we did get one comment through the portal. It was referencing sidewalks on this property. Okay. Um, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone present who would like to speak to this case? On the sign-in sheet, I did have uh, Mr. Mark Degoroff. Yes, ma'am, Mark Degoroff. Degoroff, would you like to come forward? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners, and Director Gillies for opening the floor to the residents of Chesterfield County. I'm a resident of Fox Creek. I live on Bugler's Trail Lane. And I'm also 
joined here today by four, five other residents uh, affected or, or interested in this project. There are 21 homes that back up along the property. Um, I've lived, many of us built homes on, on this property. I've been there since 2009, others since 2007. We've known all along that there will be development sooner or later. So when we first found out that Boone Homes was interested in the property, we we're very pleased to find that Mitchell Bodie and the Boone Homes organization reached out to us well in advance of any development. Um, we have, they've had two site visits with us where we've walked the entire length of the property and they've listened to our concerns. Uh, in addition, we've also had two uh, online meetings as well so that they fully understood our concerns. And most, most important to us was the 50-foot buffer area and limiting the number of easements through the 50-foot buffer area, which um, Mr. Geiger represented would be on an angle. So from a developer communication and open uh, working relationship with affected owners, we can't imagine another organization that would take our interests in mind as much as Boone Homes has. Um, and some of the items that have already been mentioned, but I'll, I'll bring out is uh, one of the families was specifically concerned. We had fences along their property through in, near the easement area where they were concerned that we were just gonna dig these pipes through and tear everything up. Well, they decided to bore, bore underground on, for the sewer lines. Uh, the large water basins filled with water and aerators will enhance our property. It's going to enhance the property all around us from our view. Plus, in many cases, some of the homes, uh, one and a half level homes, uh, will be 300 feet back from the property line because of the water basin. So uh, we couldn't ask for any, anything more. Our biggest concern was a developer coming in, scorched earth, right up to our property line and, and developing. So uh, we, we see that as um, very attractive to maintaining our properties. Uh, the 55 plus community should be a quiet community and uh, that's also um, favorable to us. Uh, the presentation mentioned a number of the current uh, developments that are ongoing in the Wool Ridge uh, Otterdale Road area. Jordan's Crossing and Cosby Village are, you know, two and three story townhomes. These, these types of developments, you know, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to look out my back door and see those. So we're happy that they're well away from our area. The one and a half uh, uh, story homes are, are favorable. From the time that uh, we started discussions, a couple of neighbors have actually put a 50, at a 50 foot line, uh, a pink tape, just to get a feel for what it's like. And because of the buffer area, and their accommodations. Now that all the, the plants are flush, you can hardly see that tape. So, so again, of the 21 homeowners, and we've had email conversations, we've walked together, not one owner has expressed um, concern against this development. They all, they all, we all feel that this property is going to be developed and we don't think we could have a better developer partner than Boone Homes working with us. Thank you, Mr. Um, Degaraf. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, is there anyone else here who would like to speak to this case? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I'm just going to uh, echo his points. We all, it was my home up. I didn't know it was on the screen from Fox Creek. But working with Boone Homes has been great. Could we I mean, have your name for the record, I'm so, please? I thought I'm sorry, Dave Chalkland. Thank you. Okay. But any effort, Mark has kind of spearheaded the effort, but we've been working with Boone now, I guess, about six months, and they've kept us fully informed. I mean, the ideal situation would be no homes behind me, but that's not reasonable, nor expectations in the future. But to get a 50-foot barrier and working with the way they have them, the layout, I think it's going to help us all and help the county. And Mark, like you said, I'm not aware of any neighbors. In fact, mine's one right on the screen that shows from Fox Creek, and I'm perfectly happy with the way it's going to turn out. And, uh, I hope that the Planning Commission works with Boone. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I stole all my thunder. I was going to go with some more points. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak to this case? Yes, sir. I see someone else coming forward. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Bert Bonner and I live in Fox Creek subdivision. I'm one of the second homes that were built in Fox Creek. Um, I moved there because of retirement. I worked for one of the local firms, D.I. DuPont, for 36 years. And I was looking for a place to find that I could spend my life, the rest of my life there, and it had to be Fox Creek subdivision. Through Toll Brothers, I built a home there. And since that inception of 2008, a lot of development in that area, a lot of development. And I guess most of you are already aware of concerning what's happening on Ottawa Road. Road. We're gonna open it up to either three lane or two lane. Woodridge been um, moved into Woodridge double lane hi highway, right up into Magnolia Green. Um, it's a lot of development in Chesterfield County. I still like to live the rest of my life out, 72 years of age. I want to stay in Fox Creek. I stand here to say that I have been very pleased to work with Boone to the point where as they have listened to us, they have allowed us to walk through and listen to enhancements and improvements. I couldn't find a better developer, even with the one that developed initially there um, versus what Boone has prepared. So I'm staying with them, support them. Uh, they're giving me a name in Fox Creek at the mayor of Fox Creek since I've been there from an exception. So the mayor supports it. <laughs> so okay. with that said, thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. Good job. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak to this case? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and bring the case back um, to the commission for Commissioner Owens. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm relatively new to the commission. This is my second year, and I went back and watched a lot of planning commission video, and one of the things that I've noted, and this is not a slam against any of the developers or anything, is that a lot of developers come in, they want to do their one community meeting and be done and try to get this in front of the commission. And um, one of the things that has really impressed me about Boone, and this is my first case I've had with Boone Homes, is the steps they have taken for outreach to the public. And if I could have every single developer take that care and that time to reach out when they're starting a project like this, these, these cases that come before the commission will be so much easier for people to understand what's going on and have less questions. Um, so I just want to commend Boone, Boone for that outreach that you did to the community. Um, you know, in some cases like this, as large as your case, you would have a lot of people up here doing the complete opposite of what just happened. Um, and I don't know if the rest of my commissioners agree with me on, on that or not, but typically you'd have a line on a project like this of people saying, no, we don't want it. Um, so if, if any, any other commissioner wants to make a, a comment before I make a motion. Mr. Petrosky. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner Owens. I, I wanna echo a little bit of that because I, I first wanna 
thank Mr. Ellis because he's worked many of my cases and he is a wonderful case manager and he did everything that the county asks him to do and his report was was spot on. So I have the utmost respect for Mr. Ellis and I think he did what he was absolutely supposed to do. At the same time, that's why we have these public hearings to, to listen to the community and to get the input. And um, I know I've only been on the commission for two years, but I, I would also love if the, if the, the applicant to proposing the development and every single neighbor affected are arm in arm, both supported this case. To me, that, I mean, that's the commission's job is to listen to the community and, and say, hey, this, this is clearly what the citizens of Chesterfield want, so we need to get creative and, and figure out how to make this work. And I also would like to thank Boone and um, Mr. Owens for, for working this case with, with, with Mr. Ellis. Let's not forget Mr. Geiger. How can you forget Mr. Geiger? <laughs> Commissioner Sloan, did you have comments? Yeah, I just want to echo really quickly um, what um, Commissioner Petrosky said, uh, e even though I may have asked Harold some challenging questions. Uh, Her Harold has, uh, Her Harold does an exemplary job of, of, of always doing what, what he's asked to do, and that is to get the very best possible development uh, that we can get. Um, you know, from applicants and so forth. And so while we may have had a dialogue about how we, what we referred to something as, it in no way whatsoever reflects, um, you know, the job that Harold's done on this case, which is absolutely outstanding. And, and, I, and I appreciate the level of detail that he's gotten into with this case. Um, and, and Commissioner Owens, the, there, there was one other time, believe it or not, where we had, we had a stream of applicants come in, and that is when Mr. Bodie, worked with a developer right up the street here with The Grove, which was another 55 and older uh, project, and they did the exact same thing there that they did with, with this project. Got the adjacent neighbors involved, and um, we had three up, three or four community meetings on that case with several hundred people coming out, and I believe on that case, they actually negotiated fencing and different landscaping based on the neighbor that, adjacent, that was adjacent to the project and um, ran extra sewer line in to help an adjacent neighborhood. So um, it makes all the difference in the world. So, you know, Mitchell, you're, you're, you're kind of in a small group there. Uh, by all means, get more members to your group. <laughs> okay, thank you, Commissioner Owens. All right, and then the last thing, they stole my thunder. Harold inherited this case kind of in the middle of it too and took this case over from um, another planner who who uh, moved on to another opportunity so Harold really picked this case up and ran with it and um, so uh, Harold you did a really good job with this and uh, you know working the case with you I know the challenges behind the scenes being the the commissioner on this that you worked with on this as well so I want to thank you for the the report um, with that being said unless anybody has any other comments I'd like to make a motion to actually approve this case and move it forward to the Board of Supervisors subject to the proffers and conditions contained therein. A second. Okay, there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we can move now to the, our next case, which is case number 21SN0603 in the Midlothian District, Sean Worley. And that's going to be presented by Ms. Wilwarka. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Mr. Gillies. I'm here tonight to present zoning case 21SN0603 in the Midlothian District. Sean Worley, the applicant, is proposing or requesting an amendment um, of zoning approval case 05SN0249 relative to a tree preservation strip and a setback in a residential R15 district. Specifically, he's re requesting to amend proffered condition 14 of the 05 case, um, which requires a 50-foot tree preservation strip along the eastern boundary of Stone Harbor subdivision, adjacent to the lots in Lenox Forest at River Downs subdivision. The applicant is requesting the amendment 
to construct an in-ground pool with a patio at grade in the rear yard of the subject property. The pool and patio would encroach into a portion of the 50-foot tree preservation area along the rear of the lot, um, as well as beyond the 10-foot setback that's required from the 50-foot tree preservation area. As conditioned, the pool and associated patio would be no closer than 18 feet from the rear of the property line. The property is zoned for residential R15 uses. The comprehensive plan designates the property for low density residential, which suggests the property is appropriate for residential development at a maximum of one dwelling unit per acre. A community meeting was held on, uh, a virtual community meeting was held on this case. Um, there were several uh, discussion items and concerns that were brought up from the community at this meeting, including the negotiation of the tree preservation strip that was included in the original zoning case. There was concern from neighbors in the Lenox Forest neighborhood regarding drainage as a result of loss of, loss of tree preservation strip. Um, as well as concern over the precedent that could be set by approving this request. There were um, discussion regarding the impacts of pr the proposal on property values, both negatively and positively, and then concern that new landscaping would not fully restore the tree preservation area. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the some of the identified topics, um, the condition relative to the pre tree preservation strip in the 05 case, as well as the setbacks were negotiated um, with area property owners um, and the developer at the time of that case. Portions of the tree preservation strip on the property were cleared prior to the applicant purchasing the property. Um, and as conditioned, the impacts on the adjacent residential development um, are being minimized and additional landscaping in areas outside of the requested encroachment um, are being proposed to be replanted to help restore some of that tr tree preservation strip. The app applicant is offering two conditions, one relative to the use and location of the encroachment, um, and specifically allowing for the proposed pool and patio as they are depicted on the conceptual layout plan, um, as well as any new drainage improvements designed to enhance on-site drainage to be permitted and constructed within that tree preservation area um, and that they can be no closer than 18 feet from the rear property line and that no additional improvements would be permitted within the preservation area. Additionally, the, the applicant is offering landscaping and screening, um, again, within the exception of the pool and patio encroachment um, depicted in the conceptual plan, the area within the tree preservation strip would still be in accordance with the condition 14 of the 05 case. Um, and generally, as shown in the exhibit, um, landscaping would be provided and maintained um, as per that plan. On the screen is the proposed layout. Uh, this version includes comments that staff gave back um, to Mr. Worley that he is uh, agreeable to. Um, that includes some additional landscaping to help restore that tree preservation area as well. Staff is recommending approval of this request. Um, again, as conditioned, impacts on adjacent residential development will be minimized, and the additional landscaping in the areas outside of the requested encroachment will help restore the tree preservation area. That concludes my presentation, presentation for this evening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Do commissioners have any questions for Ms. Rewarka? Uh, is the applicant present uh, and would like to speak? Yes, yeah, so I'd like to thank the county, Joanne and Joe and everyone that's helped me out so far. I just wanted to um, thank you all for coming out here and I just wanted to you know, there have been some concerns from our neighbors. We did reach out to them ahead of time. Everybody that was uh, on our street and the people directly adjacent behind us. Um, and if you don't mind flipping through, sir, a couple of those slides. Tell you when to stop. So this is the area in the pool. You can see where the previous people had cleared out a bunch of the trees already. Uh, there's some flags in here that kind of give you an idea where the 
edge of the patio is. Um, so you can see it's pretty cleared out already, if you don't mind advancing a little bit here. Uh, one of the main surprises for us was buying this house. We bought this house and we did a survey here and paid for it. And the tree preservation area doesn't show up on there. So that was, that was a big surprise, you know, after about a year of COVID, you know, realizing that we can't build anything in our backyard. The 58 foot setback goes all the way to our porch. Um, it's where you see it says screened in porch right there on that diagram. So like even my daughter's playground, technically we should remove that because that's, I have an anchor in the ground so it doesn't move. Um, so yeah, that was a big surprise for us. So we realized we're in this right, right now. We live here now, so we tried to work with the county to meet all the requirements. If you don't mind moving forward here. Um, we also are concerned about the environment. So we had a certified arborist for Virginia come out and let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so the small oak that we have is dead and uh, we have two oaks in there as well. If you don't mind going through, you can, uh, we'll talk about the true timber arborist <laughs> later on. Um, so they, they basically said the one tree is dead and two of the trees have hypoxia lawn, which I'll show you in a moment here. Uh, so this is the original plan, if you don't mind flipping through. Uh, we had some county revisions and uh, we met all of those, if you don't mind flipping forward again. We met all those provisions and you're welcome to look at this and meet with our landscape designer if you'd like as well. Um, next, please. And with some of the screeners we're trying to put in is like you see here on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, we're gonna be trying to put that on the right-hand side to give more screen. Just, as you can see in the winter time, you can see straight back even before we've done anything. So we're trying to make this better. You can go ahead again, sir. Um, again, this is where we're going to put some additional screenage and some trees to, to beef this up a little bit. As you can see in the winter time, you can see straight through. Next, please. Um, you can just skip through to the next one if you don't mind. This is the quote from the certified arborist talking about the damage to the tree and then uh, what they're recommending. Again, remove all those, the one tree that's dead and the two that are diseased. So that's really the only trees that would be impacted directly. Uh, next, please, sir. Uh, drainage was another concern. So we, we had drainage come out from the county. Joanne arranged for them to come out. And they looked at the, uh, the homes behind us and they're actually higher than us. So the drainage is actually coming down toward us and the drainage that we would be adding would be moving along the way that the water wants to move. So they said they would work with us and give us calculations for the drainage as well. But they believe that we are doing what was appropriate there. Next, sir. Um, and again, this is more details of the drainage, but um, you can skip, skip ahead. Uh, this is the amendment that Joanne mentioned earlier. We can skip through that. Uh, skip to that, please, sir. Um, this is the dead tree we talked about. Um, that, you know, it's just dead, straightforward. Next, please. And these are the two trees that are showing hypoxylon and canopy damage. Next, please. And this is taken just last week where you can see the, uh, you know, the canopy damage on those trees. Um, it looks like maybe something happened to the, the one tree that's leaning over to the side. I'm guessing part of it came off. So again, we are concerned about the environment and respect our, our neighbors' concerns about the trees, but these trees are damaged. So if you can go ahead, sir. So um, Hypoxylana left is a website from, from an educational website here. Um, and our tree actually shown here is on the right, and you can see the Hypoxylon that's there. And that is on both of those trees as mentioned by the arborist. Okay, thank you, sir. That's all. So. Thank you for your time, and let me know if you have any questions. Are there any questions? Um, thank you, Mr. Worley. Do the commissioners have any questions for Mr. Worley? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, Director Gillies, did you I have a question? I have one question for you, Mr. Worley. Um, yes, sir. Do you believe that the proffers that you've offered in this case are reasonable and in accordance with state law? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. <coughs> I'll now open the public hearing. Um, do, uh, Ms. Lewarka, did we get any comments on the citizen comments from staff? Um, we did receive several emails um, of support from neighbors um, that were not in the uh, comment portal, but they were included in your packet for this evening. I believe uh, Mr. Petrosky received a few of those as well. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Petrosky, did you have anything else to report as far as citizen comments? Um, yes, so uh, Ms. Wework is correct that we did receive a handful of support messages for this case. We did not receive any opposition. However, I do want to be fair and say that when Mr. Worley hosted the community meeting, uh, his adjacent neighbor did express concerns, which I, I will address those um, in my in comments. comments. Okay, thank you. 
This is a public hearing. Is there anyone present who would like to speak to this case? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and the case is now back before the commission. Commissioner Petrosky. Thank you, Madam Chair. So as was, I believe, obvious in the, in the presentation, this, this has been a well thought project. Um, Mr. Worley is doing everything properly. Um, his neighbor had some, some valid concerns about things that have happened uh, in the past before Mr. Worley owned this property. Trees were removed, and, and I understand the you know, wrongs were, were made, but everything in this case, in this proposal, I believe is pure enhancement and improvements from what Mr. Worley inherited versus what he is proposing to be uh, done with this application. So from, from my perspective, this is a value add to the community and I agree with the handful of neighbors who have also expressed that this will improve the land. So with that, I would ask my fellow commissioners to join me in recommending approval for case 21SN0603 subject to the conditions in the staff report. Second. There's been a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the vote? Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to our fifth and last case for discussion. It is case number 20SN0567 in the Clover Hill District. Lake Adventures LLC, and that will be presented by Mr. Cash. Uh, good evening again. Uh, this case, uh, 20 SN0567, is in the Clover Hill District. It is actually an amendment of a previous zoning approval, um, case 16 SN0704, um, clues provisions related to cash proffers, master plan, utilities, transportation improvements, and the variety of things listed on your screen. In addition, there's also a request um, for exception um, to permit the sale for on-site consumption alcoholic beverages within 500 feet of a school. Um, and this is located in a regional business C4 district. Um, before it gets contradicted by the applicant, this is always previously known as the water park case. Um, it's Lake Adventure. Um, is currently proposal. Um, as you see, there's any map. Uh, the property is um, currently C4. It's located across the street from Clover Hill High School, adjacent to RMF um, property, also industrial property, light industrial properties um, to the north, and across the of uh, across from two across 288 is the the current um, recreational sports park as well. Um, included in here in the aerials, you can see the current developments um, adjacent to them. Um, the Genito Place um, is a proposed road that really will bisect this property. Um, this is in a regional mixed use um, area, recommended um, for regional mixed use under the comprehensive plan. So the current uh, master plan for the development um, is shown here. Um, there has been no proposed change to the original layout for this plan. Um, that is, allows a variety of types of uses. So we're talking about commercial, potentially industrial, um, recreational uses, high density multifamily, um, and townhouse development. Um, should be noted on the master plan that track C, which does show for townhouse, could po be potentially developed for light industrial under the case. Um, that would have to be identified prior to any development occurring on track B. I won't go into depth on the, the case history, uh, just to sort of give touch on some of the highlights. Um, again, this was proposed in the 16 case, 16 SN 05, I'm sorry, a vote, 16 SN 0704, um, for this to be a, a mixed use center um, with a water park with water features to include a 13 acre recreational lake, a proposed white water attraction. The residential density was 790 units. Um, there was also cash proffers in addition to access and road improvements. There were architectural standards provided in that case to make sure that we had enhanced um, development on the residential side 
um, as I shared with you earlier um, this afternoon. This was um, more unique and new for the county at the time that we had, we advanced such um, improvements for the architecture um, that were provided in this case. There was also a provision regarded in the case related to um, concerns about noise um, and the operate, operational limitation hours related to the music, um, potential music venue and the speaker usage for that attraction. Um, the case went so, so far as to um, label uh, specific decibel levels um, adjacent to um, certain communities within Brander Mill to address that concern. Um, in 2018, again, there was amendments uh, related to the recreational lake to make sure we were enhancing the safety features for the lake um, as far as discharge into the public systems, um, the permitted use um, of supplemental filling for the public water system, and some modification to landscaping treatments in certain tracks, and uh, some changes to the plantings that would be within the Route 288 setback. So we get into the proposal for tonight. Um, one of the highlights um, that really would leap off the page when, you, when I first um, started to manage this case was there was um, an increase in residential density. Um, residential density was a concern during the, the history of this case um, to, to make sure we strike the balance between um, the commercial and recreational and other types of non-residential development coming forward and what the residential density was going to be. Um, so there is the proposal, like I said, of 400 additional units. It would raise the maximum number of units on the property to 1190, um, with up to 830 of those being, being multifamily. However, this is offset in a lot of ways because the multifamily that's being proposed um, is actually now less than the original multifamily track, which was track A. Townhouses are generally consistent, but slightly smaller than they would have been before, density-wise. Um, but the bulk of units are coming inside of mixed-use buildings located in um, the commercial side of the property. Those buildings will come forward with 20,000 square feet of commercial within each building. There's a limitation of the number of units per building. Um, they also are limited in their, in their bedrooms that are permitted to 5% um, of such units can have three or more bedrooms. And 95% of the parking related to this building is provided in structured parking. Um, that is an enhancement um, significantly over the previous case, and that's something unusual in Chesterfield that you get this Crawford structured parking. Um, there is proposed with this case an alternative water attraction. Um, originally, the case recommend or the case requested and offered that they would be doing a white water um, attraction. There's also proposed now to be a surf pool um, with a Crawford minimum of one acre um, pool size. Um, there is reduction in the common area and the clubhouse um, within tracks B and C, which are the townhouse tracks. Um, I would staff, you know, that is a concern when we feel like we take away common area from certain features. I will say that being in a mixed-use environment um, located uh, adjacent to a recreational lake and other type of opportunities with sidewalks and the like, um, staff is okay with that reduction in open space. Um, there are a provision to permit 16-foot um, townhouse units. Uh, previously, I believe it was 19 was the smallest. Um, with this provision of that, it does give the opportunity to have a sort of more of a mix of housing types, potentially within that townhouse development, potentially different price points and lifestyles. The 16-foot units um, for the um, provisions of, that's provided in the textual statement from the applicant would allow that for every 16-foot unit, there is a 24-foot unit um, in that same row, 24 is, 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 is on the larger side for a townhouse. And, um, but they've also proffered, the, I mean, in the textual statement, sorry, 20% of the units of um, maybe 16 foot. Um, for the alcoholic beverage consumption on, for on-site consumption, the sale of alcoholic beverages for on-site consumption. Um, this is sort of a cleanup for this case. Uh, there was a brewery permitted and approved under the original 16 case. Um, it was appropriate for them to clarify that this condition, um, that sales of alcohol is permitted within 500 feet of um, Clover Hill High School. Um, should be noted, this is a regional mixed use node. You would anticipate hotels, you would anticipate restaurants and other types of destinations where on-site um, sale of alcohol would be, would, would, um, be provided. Um, delete proffers three and eight related to the cash proffers, and there's also phasings of the residential improvements. 
I won't go through the phasing um, um, of those improvement changes, um, but suffice to say, there's a, there, the balance has been done to match uh, what was previously um, worked out and agreed upon during the original review. Um, so we make sure we strike the balance of improvements um, provided by the developer, commercial development that helps offset the impact of the increased or amount of um, residential density. And so staff does recommend um, the approval subject to the conditions in the staff report and the addendum. I would clarify the addendum this afternoon, this evening that was provided to you relates to a setback um, clarification for townhouse development and adds in there an exhibit that should have been in the staff report. There was some staff miscommunication, but it details um, uh, the, the potential um, location of the, the 288 access as far as um, um, dedication. So, uh, of course, uh, if there's any questions for me, please let me know. Okay, do commissioners have any questions for Mr. Cash? All right, seeing none, we'll ask the applicant to come forward. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission, Director Gillies, I'm Jack Wilson. It's my pleasure to represent the applicant this evening. Um, first of all, I do want to uh, thank uh, Ray and the staff for the hard work that they've put on to get this case to where it is this evening. I think um, there's a lot of moving parts to it. Those of you, Ms. Fry and Mr. Sloan, who dealt with the case the first go round, um, the same number of parts are there, they're still moving. <laughs> but we think we've got them figured out now. So, um, and of course, I agree with the uh, staff recommendation. I couldn't say that five years ago, but we can now. So we've obviously made some progress on this case. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Ms. Fry for your input throughout this. It's been critical to make sure we get this, this right. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through the same level of detail that, that uh, Mr. Cass just went through. But again, what we are looking to do here is just amend the existing case to make it a better case. We appreciate the opportunity to have the work session today so those of you that weren't on the commission could sort of be brought up to speed. You got brought up to speed in 20 minutes for cases that took you know hours and hours to work through, but you could see the vision, uh, and this vision is close to becoming a reality. So again, tonight, um, all we're seeking are, are some amendments to the existing case. The first one, again, is the conditional use permit to allow for the sale of alcohol for on-site consumption. Again, Ms. Fry brought that up in the course of this. That was overlooked twice <laughs> in two amendments, but clearly this case was always one that was going to have restaurants and, and other types of entertainment venues, so we clearly needed to have that conditional use permit. Um, we are adjusting some of the standards for townhouses, again, just to provide for that uh, architectural style and mix of townhouse units. Um, we are adding a surf pool as an option as the main water feature. Uh, again, uh, you recall in the original case, it was a white water. Uh, that um, has changed and, and the surf pool uh, is what's being proposed now. And, th and there's a lot of details about the surf pool, but um, the, the wavelength that's mentioned in the proffer um, as constructed would be the largest surf pool uh, of its type in the United States upon completion. Um, that surf pool and those criteria that are in that proffer are probably 50 to 75 percent more expensive than the whitewater would have been. But the added benefit is it sits on a smaller footprint, so there's more opportunity for other commercial development around the surf pool if we go that route. Um, the case also does bring the, the case into conformity with the current uh, road cash proffer policy. Um, and again, we are uh, looking at uh, doing over $7 million of off-site road improvements in connection with the case, and the cash proffer policy um, addresses that. And then as Ray mentioned in his closing, really what we are doing is adding to this the opportunity to put in these mixed use buildings uh, on the commercial side of the project. That allows for a number of things uh, for the development to be even a higher quality project and vision than, than first envision. Um, it allows for that structured parking. And what that uh, enables, obviously, the structured parking would support the mixed use building itself, but because of the county ordinances dealing with shared parking and opportunities on site, um, we can get a higher density commercial uh, development without all the surface parking that would normally be required to support it. So, um, but those mixed use buildings really only work if you've got a residential component to them. So that is why we're bringing those uh, onto the case, and I think it makes it a much better case. I do want to address, I know the um, Brander Mill Community Association had sent a letter, uh, and I wanted to, you know, sort of address those comments so that you would, um, 
and again, I may want to come back up after any other comments to address them further, but basically they had three uh, areas of, of concern that they raised. One was traffic, uh, second was noise, and third is parking. As to the traffic, um, we first, when the project first started, did a full traffic impact analysis that was approved by VDOT. Uh, in connection with the amendment, that traffic impact analysis was updated, again approved by VDOT, and all the road improvements that we were proposing in the original case are still in the case. So no um, deletions of any road improvements, and uh, CDOT in its staff report, and I think you know, Mr. Adams is here, will confirm that all those road improvements uh, mitigate the um, impact from our, our project. And again, we're gonna have over seven million of off-site road improvements. Um, the one uh, exhibit that was added in the addendum, we actually um, are dedicating right away for the 288 ramp. The original case said we would reserve space. Now that that project has, has uh, matured a little bit, we're actually in a position to dedicate the right of way on our property for that future ramp. And we're um, gonna do that within 120 days of board approval. And the only other thing on traffic that I would mention is because we're bringing the road uh, improvements into conformity with the road cash proffer, in order to get that credit for those offsite improvements, we will probably accelerate the construction of some of those offsite road improvements. Uh, under the original case, those offsite road improvements would have been triggered by trip counts generated at the time of site plan. Now, in order to get the road credit, we actually have to put the roads on the ground, uh, even though they might not be needed based on the trip generation uh, of the project itself. We have to put the roads in in order to get the credit. So we'll end up accelerating those. Noise uh, was the second issue raised. Again, that was addressed in the original case. There's a very uh, detailed condition uh, in that case that we clearly cannot violate. That was based on extensive noise studies. Um, and so we've seen no need to change that, and all the parking will be on site. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, do you, any of the commissioners have a question for Mr. Wilson? Uh, I did have a question for you, Mr. Wilson, about um, the, the noise study and the way that proffered condition is worded. Um, that applies to noise that's created by any of the outside activities. That, that is No correct. matter what they it, are. Exactly, there's it, a noise, that's the requirement. We can't exceed that noise condition. Uh, and again, the, um, I think it was mentioned at the work session, but the phase one site plan has already been approved. Uh, that includes the main lake as well as the amphitheater. So all of the design for that was designed to make sure that it could comply with that noise condition. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from Commissioner for Mr. Wilson at this time? We, we do have someone signed up to speak, um, but I will go ahead and open the public hearing. And um, uh, Mr. Cash, we have heard that, that we have the citizen comments from the Brander Mill Homeowners Association. Is there, are there any other comments or citizen comments that you would need to report? Um, I believe for the portal there was um, a comment related to sidewalks. Um, for the area, um, and uh, for um, which is we've seen for other projects tonight, um, and there has, do not believe there's another item in the portal. I've had phone conversations with different members of the community, um, their uh, Brandon Road community, and their concerns are pretty much what's outlined in the, um, the letter that the Brandon Road community sent in regards to traffic, uh, potential parking implemented from the attraction to the Linton neighborhoods and. Um, Jack addressed that a moment ago. Okay, thank you. And uh, this is in the Clover Hill District, and, and I do not have any other uh, citizen comments to add to, to those that have already, already been reported. Um, I have opened the public hearing. This is a public hearing where anyone present uh, would be uh, permitted to come forward and speak to the case, and we do have Mr. Pearson who signed up to do that. here. <laughs> Make sure I don't violate some of the rules. Uh, so I'm allowed to put my hands on this, right? Okay, thank you. And you, 
And, <laughs> and you can take your mask off. Too, oh, yes. And, and I'm very pleased to say that I could take my mask off without disrupting my new hearing aids, oh, which is a little taking a little used to getting. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission, Mr. D Director Gilly Gillies, my name is Greg Pearson, a resident of Clover Hill District, with my five predictions regarding this amended case. Number one, part of the lake is in the Branmore footprint, which, was, which will likely impact property values for Branmore and surrounding neighborhoods negatively. The Lake Adventures case has attracted some, but not enough attention for what will happen to our suburban road network. With all the left-hand turns necessary to access the park, an access ramp off southbound 288 onto Genito Road and a flyover across inbound Pohite Parkway onto Tredegar Lake Parkway will be a necessity. Prediction number two. If those materialize, it will be congestion first and those road improvements later. The developer's promotional material pledges 200 plus events and 40 plus concerts annually. When subtracting four cold weather months, that means about one outdoor event per day. A particular concern is the case includes a provision to have off-site parking for events and concerts on what will become an overburdened road network. One of the endorsers four years ago on this case was East Coast Entertainment, a concert booking company, which has 16 offices throughout the U.S., including Richmond. Prediction number three. As a former GM of rock radio stations and country radio stations in a previous life, uh, the lake will, will uh, attract their involvement in concerts, and the concert goers will be beating a path to the concert site. While Dogwood Dell ends its weekend concerts by 10.30 on weekends, the lake has weeknight shows ending at 11 p.m., weekends at midnight, and five times a year up to 1 a.m. Prediction number four, the congestion the county is creating by this case will light up Facebook on a regular basis after each road clogging event or concert, generating frequent emails to county leaders and some normally apathetic citizens will even traipse here to speak before the county board. Though already approved in the case, staff, uh, staff, this commission and the county board needs to renegotiate off-site parking out of the case. That will lessen the impact on roads. Chesterfield has the leverage, in my opinion, if you're willing to use it. Prediction number five. Unfortunately, you won't. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Is there anyone else present who would like to speak to this case? Uh, Mr. Wilson, would you like a rebuttal? Uh, very brief. Um, first, dealing with property values, I think the, clearly the uh, the nature of this project and will increase the property values in that immediate vicinity. The architectural quality of the townhouses, everything is going to just enhance uh, that corridor. So we we think this will be a benefit to the Brander Mill community in terms of property values. We also uh, are very supportive of a ramp off of 288 right onto Genito. Uh, we were supportive of that from the very beginning in this case. Uh, and now we've even stepped a little further by actually dedicating right away for it. Um, that'll be done um, again, within 120 days of board approval. So the right away that's needed on our property for that ramp will be given free to the county. We've also got a condition that to the extent additional right away might be needed, we would give that to the county for free too, so long as it didn't you know, 
cut through the middle of the lake or something like that. But to the extent the future right away was needed that we could give, we would give it to the county for free. So we clearly are supportive of that ramp. Um, you heard um, the, the notion of 200 events, but I think you heard today uh, at the work session, many of those events are gonna be a little yoga thing in the common area, in that green space. There's not 200 big, large traffic generating events. These are, again, community events that are gonna be held in that common area, that green space at the site. Um, and again, as to parking, um, the first phase site plan, which again deals with the main lake, the amphitheater, uh, the first 40 some thousand square feet of commercial space, all has the parking necessary for it on site, um, on that site plan. And again, with the addition of the structured parking, uh, we will able, be able to meet all the parking requirements on site. Um, so uh, parking and off-site parking uh, won't be an issue. And again, at the time of site plan, um, if we were ever to have to um, look for some off-site uh, parking arrangement, that would have to be approved at the time of site plan. We'd have to be able to show that we um, have such an arrangement in place. But again, at the time of site plan, we're gonna be showing all our parking on site uh, primarily in these structured parking uh, decks that we're gonna be constructing. And again, the noise condition uh, was very, very carefully thought out uh, five years ago. Thousands and thousands of dollars spent on a noise study, uh, very specific conditions. Uh, Supervisor Winslow actually imposed that condition based on the results of the noise study. And um, while it was a little more detailed than the applicant wanted, um, it was something that he recognized he could agree with and, and honor. So again, the site plan is designed to meet that noise condition. So with that, uh, we still ask for your favorable recommendation. Uh, Mr. Wilson, I did have a question. Um, so on the option, I guess, the alternative of off-site parking, if it is needed, uh, you're not are you, you're not talking about parking on Genito Road or public roads? No, not at all. We wouldn't be able, to, we couldn't meet our parking requirements by counting on parking on Genito Road or something like that. Um, and again, if, to the extent there was an off-site parking arrangement, presumably it'd be with the office park, but we're not contemplating that. Um, again, the first phase, which is where the primary event driven stuff will be, the, the amphitheater, the, the main lake, some of those things um, already have the parking on the first phase site plan to support all of those uses. So when we bring in the commercial uses, that's where the structured parking will come into play to take care of those. So we have all the parking we need on so site. You, you, you feel like that with the addition of the structured parking, um, there'd be even less of a need for offsite parking. And if there were offsite parking, it, how would it, how could it affect the, the Brander Mill residents? I don't know. Again, I, at this point, there isn't any anticipation that there would be a need for off-site parking. Um, so, uh, so clearly, it wouldn't be on public streets to the extent there was any. Um, but there hasn't been any discussion internally about off-site parking. Everything's going to be on-site. So I don't know what concern there would be if it's all on-site, including obviously in the structured parking facilities. Okay, and Director Gillies, did you have a question for Mr. Wilson? The one question was, do you believe that the proffers you're offering tonight to be reasonable and in accordance with state law? Yes, we did. <laughs> um, I would like to ask Mr. Adams, if you're available, uh, could you come to the podium, please? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was hoping to ask. Oh, okay. oh, I'm sorry. I grabbed the mic. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, Mr. Adams, we've talked about the concerns about traffic and congestion, and I think even Mr. Wilson made a comment about moving pieces, <laughs> and I think that that's what's happened a little bit with this amendment. There's been shifting of the amount of residential, the amount of commercial, the amount of office park, uh, even I guess the recreational um, features have, have, have shifted. Um, how how have um, those changes affected the, the road impacts and, and how are they being mitigated uh, with these changing um, areas? So with the original 2016 case, they did a traffic study, as Mr. Wilson mentioned. Um, we did accept that traffic study and it did provide um, multiple road improvements and they proffered to provide those road improvements. 
with this amendment, they did a revision to that traffic study and they modified their densities. They did increase the residential uses. Um, they decreased the business park by just over 100,000 square feet. And the bottom line was it did increase the traffic slightly, but their proffered road improvements that were provided with the 2016 case got carried over to this case and they will address the traffic impact. Okay, thank you. I didn't have, do any commissioners have any other questions for Mr. Adams? Um, Mr. Wilson, could you come forward again? We have a, a couple other questions. Commissioner Owens. So I have uh, one question and one comment. The first question is, with the concern of the evening events and the number of those generating noise, would you consider at some point before the Board of Supervisors negotiating a proffer limiting the number of those evening events that would go into the evening from it being encompassing in the 200 events to say we could have X events that go into the evening hours that would generate noise? We can, we can look at doing that, but again, I'm not sure. The ultimate I issue is the noise, um, whether we have one event or 200, we have to meet the noise requirements. So the noise will not impact the adjacent neighbors. Just, just and, asking the question. Yeah, it's something we can look at. Yes, sir, Mr. Owens. But again, some of these events, what, what is defined as an event, if it's like, a, a, as um, the applicant mentioned earlier at the work session, if it's a wine cheese party in the open space and there's 10 people there, that's, one of those 200 events. And if that goes into the evening, I don't know that we would want to limit that. So Mr. Wilson, is there anything about the amendment, the application that's before us, that would generate any additional noise? No, in fact, I, if we go with a surf pool, it'll probably generate less noise, even than the white water would have. Okay. Uh, and and the, the second thing is a comment. Um, this is another example of a case that highlights one of our ordinances that is a problem. Um, the ordinance having to do, and is that Jim McConnell back there? Please don't write me as the drinking commissioner, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> this ordinance, I believe, says something about um, out of all the schools in the county, 54 out of the 63 are exempt from the ordinance. And I, eventually I'm going to, to write up a change to this ordinance, but it, this is just a bad ordinance that exempts like 90% of the schools. So I just wanted to highlight that in the case. Commissioner Sloan. Mr. Wilson, just for clarification, um, the applicant in this case is adding the surf pool as an additional option in addition to the white water. We're not replacing the white water. We're, we're simply giving the applicant the discretion to choose from two options in addition to the main lake. Correct? That's correct. Thank you. Any other questions before I let Mr. Wilson sit down? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Wilson. I'm going to now close the public hearing. Um, this case is in the Clover Hill District um, and does seek several amendments uh, to the 2016 the 2018 cases, um, in addition to cleaning up some things um, from the first cases. Uh, it would accept road improvements in lieu of the cash proffers. Uh, this amendment would allow the sale of alcoholic beverages. Um, it does adjust the phasing of the road improvements, which would actually um, create the need for those road improvements to be um, improved and uh, constructed sooner rather than later. Uh, it does give more options for the facility to have a surf pool uh, as well, which wasn't contemplated in the first for zoning, it does adjust some of the townhome standards to give a um, wider range of um, housing product that wasn't there before. I, I think the thing that concerned me the most when the amendment came in was additional density and how was that going to be offset with uh, commercial development so that we would truly have a mixed use development and with the proffers, uh, and that have been worked out, the phasing of those additional units, the uh, form of them being in mixed use with commensurate commercial development at the time they are developed and not being developed until the lake is approved finally, that with then with the addition of structured parking, all 
helped me be assured that we would truly have a balanced mixed-use development that would have no greater uh, impact on the community than the original case and actually built in some assurances that weren't there with the dedication of that ramp, uh, the right-of-way for the proposed ramp. Uh, we all recognize that that ramp and the other improvements that are contemplated in that area are um, in the jurisdiction of VDOT, but having the applicant uh, developer actually dedicate that right-of-way certainly will facilitate the county standing in working with VDOT to see and make that ramp a reality if they can. So with the, for those reasons, I um, feel comfortable with this amendment and comfortable to uh, recommend approval. So I move to recommend approval of case 20SN0567, subject to the conditions in the staff report and the addendum for those reasons. Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any additional discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the vote? Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you. So that completes our zoning cases uh, for this evening and brings us to the public hearing on Code Amendment 20PJ0121, the Midlothian Special Design District and parking for certain office and commercial uses countywide. And this will be presented by Ms. Wawarka. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission, uh, Mr. Gillies. This evening, I'm here to present the draft Midlothian Special Design District, um, and, we'll and we'll be providing um, an overview of the major concepts that are covered in the ordinance. First, I want to start off by providing a little bit of background. So the Midlothian Community Special Area Plan was adopted in December of 2019 and serves as the vision and guide for future growth and development within the village of Midlothian. The plan provides recommendations for land use, infrastructure improvements, and includes a design plan section that outlines high quality village scale design standards. One of the implementation items included in the plan was to update the Midlothian Special Design District to codify the design plan recommendations to ensure that new and redevelopment within the village complements and enhances the village style of development pattern of the area. Over the, over the last several months, staff, along with Commissioner Petrosky, um, met with community members, individuals, and groups um, for community review and input and feedback on the draft design standards, um, meetings with um, homeowners associations, the Midlothian Business Alliance, as well as several um, commercial property owners within the area, as well as area um, rotaries and other groups. Um, occurred during this time and several comments were also uh, provided to staff um, online through an online comment portal. Uh, revisions were prepared to the draft based on the comments that we received from the community. The draft before you today addresses office, commercial, multifamily, and mixed-use development and is a substantial revision of the existing standards for the area, providing greater protections for the village. <clears throat> the draft design district covers the following standards that are outlined on this slide. These standards are intended to address both the aesthetic of the community along with the form and function, including topics of architectural treatment and building design to ensure new development is compatible and cohesive with existing development, um, especially that of historic interest, as well as things like bicycle and pedestrian amenities, the road network and vehicle access to ensure connectivity throughout the village. The purpose and intent of the Midlothian Special Design District is to implement the design recommendations of this Midlothian Community Special Area Plan and recognize the area's cultural, architectural, and historic heritage. 
It is the purpose of this district to maintain and reinforce the character, identity, and pedestrian scale by enhancing existing development patterns, encouraging highly integrated infill development, promoting redevelopment of underutilized land, and providing amenities in order to create a vibrant village environment to live, work, learn, play, and visit. The area covered by the draft design district is shown on this map. The boundaries of the special design district are based off of the village core boundaries in the adopted special area plan. The draft, <coughs> the draft ordinance addresses setbacks for both buildings and parkings. The draft includes reduced setbacks for buildings, locating buildings closer to roads to establish a main street village feel, while ensuring that setbacks are sufficient enough to allow for required improvements, including sidewalks, bikeways, landscaping, street trees, and street lights that are outside of the right-of-way. The draft also establishes minimum and maximum setbacks to provide a constant frontage along roads while allowing for variation between buildings, an area for hardscaped plazas, outdoor dining, and the like. In order to help facilitate the village scale development pattern, buffers are being eliminated in order to promote proximity and connectivity between uses, with the exception of new development adjacent to existing single family residential where buffers will remain. The reduced setbacks and buffers are intended to facilitate the village scale development pattern and Main Street feel envisioned within the special area plan while also providing more usable areas for businesses as well as community amenities. To minimize the view and impact of parking lots from roads, parking is generally set back behind buildings or where there is not a building through the use of decorative walls, fences, evergreen hedges, or a combination of these. The standards for architectural treatment have been expanded within the draft ordinance to ensure that buildings are designed in a manner that imparts harmonious proportions and avoids monotonous facades and large bulky masses, while also possessing architectural variety and maintaining the cohesive character and compatibility with existing structures of high historic, cultural, or architectural interest. Buildings shall enhance the, an overall cohesive district through the use of the design elements, including but not limited to those that are outlined on this slide. Included in the draft ordinance is a reference to the architectural styles that are recommended and recognized as being of high historic, cultural, and architectural value within the Midlothian Community Special Area Plan that new development shall be compatible with. These styles promote the vernacular architecture of the region and includes those listed on this slide. In order to maintain the integrity of these architectural styles, individual buildings should not reference multiple styles or eras. The draft ordinance sets the maximum building height for office and commercial uses at three stories. In mixed use projects, if a building contains a multifamily component, they may go up to four or five stories with additional design considerations and requirements, including that any building exceeding the three stories and up to the five may, must be located at least 100 feet from the Lothian Turnpike as well as 100 feet from single family development. Additional common area is also required for the stories above three and that a portion of the parking must be provided as structured or deck parking. For buildings that are fronting along Midlothian Turnpike and exceeding two stories, um, step backs shall be provided at either the second or third floor. This will help create the appearance of a two-story building from the street level and helps avoid the canyoning effect along Midlothian Turnpike that was a concern from the community during the planning process. In order to help facilitate street level activity and a welcoming environment for pedestrians, the first floor of any building facade facing a road or common area or plaza shall incorporate storefront windows and pedestrian entrances. To help break up longer buildings where building lengths exceed 250 feet, buildings shall provide breezeways or similar designs to accommodate pedestrian access um, to parking located to the rear. And these should be lighted and decorative spaces. One of the guiding principles of the special area plan was for Midlothian to be a pedestrian and bike friendly community, including improvements that will provide area residents and visitors with safe alternative transportation options, as well as recreational opportunities. 
The ordinance lays out that sidewalk, pedestrian, and bicycle amenities are to be provided along all roads as outlined in the Midlothian Community Special Area Plan and as pedestrian connections from projects to adjacent development. The draft ordinance promotes using setbacks along roads for hardscaped pedestrian areas, providing more usable area for business and the community than what we traditionally see in a suburban setback. Hardscaped areas within the setbacks shall be designed to facilitate and include amenities to support outdoor gatherings and activities such as outdoor dining, temporary vendors, civic or community events, or seating areas. These may also include pedestrian amenities and streetscaping. Streetscaping requirements help establish a uniform pattern and design for landscaping and lighting along roadways. Pedestrian scale decorative streetlights shall be designed to enhance the pedestrian character and design of the district. The ordinance addresses spacing, height, and compatibility with the existing gooseneck lighting in the area. Increasing the common area requirement within office and commercial parks, as well as mixed use developments and shopping centers will ensure that throughout the village, there are places for people to gather and socialize. These areas can be provided as hardscaped or landscaped areas or plazas for public use. Connectivity and vehicular access are important tools to ensure that with any new development, we are improving access for people walking, biking, or driving throughout the village. Roads and private pavement serving development shall be arranged to accommodate pedestrian-friendly street-focused environment, including things like the interconnected pattern of walkable blocks, um, the blocks with mid-block crossings um, and access for pedestrian between parallel roads and street designs that accommodate amenities such as sidewalks, bikeways, street trees, pedestrian lighting, and pedestrian crosswalks. <clears throat> In order to promote a pedestrian-friendly development pattern, automobile-oriented uses are discouraged within the village core in the special area plan. If these uses were to occur, the draft ordinance establishes design con considerations that reduce the impacts of these types of uses, including drive-through and drive-in facilities, as well as gasoline pumps. The draft ordinance allows for a reduction of minimum parking requirements with additional provisions for off-site parking, pickup and drop-off areas, proximity to transit, and shared parking. The overall parking reduction is capped at 15% to still ensure that adequate parking is being provided within development. Where appropriate, deck parking structures um, shall be designed with either commercial or office uses located along the ground floor or be located behind another building on the lot or designed with an architectural facade treatments. <clears throat> The design controls for mixed use and multifamily development are a new component of the special design district that have not been previously addressed within the village core. These uses would be allowed as a conditional use, still requiring proposed development to go through the zoning process, provided such use and the project in which it, the, it's located complies with the following. The property is zoned for office or commercial uses, the base office and commercial standards that were previously discussed and outlined apply, as well as additional standards for mixed use and multifamily. For the purposes of these draft ordinances, we are talking about multifamily incorporated into a mixed use project, either through vertical mixed use, where multifamily is located in a building containing office or commercial uses on the first floor, or horizontal mixed use, where multifamily is integrated into a project containing commercial, office, or other permitted non-residential uses. Standalone multifamily projects are not addressed through this ordinance. Um, additional requirements that would need to be addressed include restrictive covenants to ensure the long-term care, maintenance, and operation of these developments, additional common area for buildings that exceed three stories, and then lastly, a limit on the number of three bedroom plus units to address some of the school capacity concerns that were heard through the planning process. This concludes my presentation for this evening. Um, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Bewarka. Do commissioners have any questions for Ms. Bewarka and Commissioner Um, I'd just like to make a comment. Um, I, I want to 
just kind of tip my hat to, to you and the whole team that's been working on this project so incredibly diligently over the past uh, six months now, seven months, somewhere in there. Um, the, the quality of the work is outstanding, um, and, 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 and you, know, you guys deserve a tremendous amount of the credit in working with uh, the various stakeholders and so forth, and, and you guys should be really proud of, of what you brought before us tonight, and I appreciate it. Thank you. We couldn't have done this without the help of Ray Cash. <laughs> Um, any other comments or questions from the commissioners? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, did uh, Ms. Waworka, did we receive citizen comments about the design standards amendment? Not as a part of the, the portal the, or the public hearing, just the comments that we received when we went through the, the community outreach process. Community outreach, okay. Okay, and Commissioner Petrosky, did you have anything specific to add on citizen comments? Nope, just the same as mm -hmm. Ms. Weworker. Okay, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone present who would like to speak on this code amendment? Seeing no one, uh, I'll close the public hearing and bring the amendment before the commission and uh, turn it over to Commissioner Petrosky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Miwerka, and, and Mr. Cash, and, and the rest of staff. Commissioner Sloan is, is spot on that, that you have spent, you said a couple months, it feels like at least a year, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Um, it, it was a lot of work by the staff, and, he, and even Commissioner Sloan ser served on our implementation committee with 10 citizens who have helped out um, in many meetings, and uh, we did kind of do, do the road show as we called it. We went out to several business groups, civic groups. Um, and that being said though, even though a lot of work has been put into this, there's been some recent feedback that I feel like there are still a few things that we want to button up and it's not quite ready for us to be done working yet, unfortunately. So while we do appreciate the work, a little bit more left. So um, with that, I would actually like to ask my Fellow commissioners, I, I propose that we um, postpone voting on this until our June 15th meeting, um, postpone the vote for Code Amendment 20PJ0121. Is there a second? Point of clarification, Madam Chair. So we're reserving, the, you're asking us to reserve the vote for 30 days. Public hearing has been closed, however. That is correct. Thank you for the clarification, and I'm happy to second the motion. I just want to say clarify till the next meeting, not 30 days. The June 15th meeting. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion and a second um, to defer the vote on this amendment to June 15, 2021. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous and that motion passes. Thank you. Okay, so we are now at the item that was added to our agenda, 19B, the initiation of code amendment relative to Route 1 residential overlay. And I'll turn to Commissioner Sloan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at, at, as we have discussed uh, at, at multiple points through our, um, through our multitude of cases uh, th this evening and this afternoon, um, one of the conclusions that we can come to is when we enact uh, large, substantial pieces of ordinance language, um, there are times that um, it, it's only when we allow something to get out and be practically used that we realize that, that, that there are ways that we can enhance and make that, um, make that legislation better. And um, under Virginia law, the, the, the state of Virginia empowers the commission to uh, initiate amendments to an existing zoning ordinance when we feel that it's required either out of public necessity, convenience, general welfare, or just to make sure that we're uh, staying within uh, good zoning practices. So what I would ask our, uh, what I would ask the commission today um, 
is to approve the item that's before us. Uh, staff has identified it as item 19B. Um, that Perhaps that item number may, may change uh, as we go through this. Uh, but the request, uh, my motion is to approve this item that we have before us. Um, which will allow us to initiate an amendment to the Route 1 residential overlay. Um, in consideration, uh, we, will, uh, we will look at the amendment and look at how the amendment currently addresses um, either in its, um, its successes or where we need further improvements uh, to such items as such setbacks, common areas, density, uh, parking required amenities, amongst other things that that we would look look at, um, and other development issues that um, that are related to the provisions in that overlay. Do we have a motion? Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to initiate this code amendment relative to Route One residential overlay. Is there any discussion? No discussion. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the vote? Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote is unanimous and that motion passes. Thank you. Um, that brings us to our second citizen comment period. Um, I don't have anyone signed up to speak, so Director Gillies, before you uh, go over those procedures, I'll just ask, is there anyone present who would like to speak on an unscheduled matter? That would be any matter that was not has not been on today's agenda. Seeing no one, we can move on to um, other business. And do commissioners have anything else they'd like to discuss this evening? Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask Director Gillies is about is what would be the most appropriate time to consider for uh, our the timing of our next work session? Um, I think uh, three o'clock would be a, a good time. We, we're gonna have a pretty full agenda that evening again, so I don't wanna make too long of a work session for y'all on top of that. So I think we'll get what we can in for, in, for at a three o'clock. I can't remember if we have a four o'clock session. I don't think so for next month. So. <laughs> We may pick up a little bit of time then. So I would say three would be an appropriate time to adjourn to. Okay, um, so since we don't have any other business to discuss, do I have a motion to adjourn to 3 p.m. Tuesday, June 15, 2021? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the vote? Mrs. Fry? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Sloan? Aye. Dr. Hilton? Aye. Mr. Petrosky? Aye. Madam Chair, the vote's unanimous for adjournment. We are adjourned. They inverted the numbers on that report. That's why I thought they were inverted as well.